Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with Cheese Twist Christmas Tree. That's right, tis the season when we have to make delicious holiday snacks. Whether it's to feed visiting guests or one of those parties where everyone has to bring a thing, And I think this beautiful, easier than it looks, pull apart Christmas tree is the thing you should bring. I mean, you can't keep showing up with just a bottle of wine. Which reminds me, this goes great with a bottle of wine. So maybe bring both. And the first thing we'll need to get started is some frozen puff pastry. Which for us home cooks never comes in a perfect square piece. Alright, it's usually folded together somehow and looks like this with a bunch of annoying seams. And there are many things I miss about the professional kitchen, right? The free food, the free booze, the free love. But one of the things I miss most is being able to work with perfect sheet pan sized pieces of puff pastry. But no matter how it comes, once we unwrap it, we'll go ahead and flour it lightly on both sides and then attempt to roll it into a square about an eighth of an inch thick. And then what we'll do once we've completed the rolling and the squaring is take a knife or a pizza wheel and cut from the bottom corner or about an inch above the bottom corner, all the way up to the center point of the top. And we'll do that on both sides to form a triangle, which conveniently is about the same shape as a Christmas tree. And then once those cuts have been made, we will transfer this piece onto a Silpat line baking sheet, and we will pop that in the fridge until we need it. At which point we're gonna take those two pieces of dough we just cut off, and we're gonna place those together, overlapping them by about a half inch or so, and we'll push and press those together to form a second triangle roughly the same size as the first. And then once we have that formed, we'll take a rolling pin to sort of flatten this out a little bit and also to screw up the shape of the top, but not really. As you'll see, this is gonna look great no matter how perfect or imperfect these pieces are. And that's it, we will carefully transfer that piece onto a line sheet pan and we'll transfer that into the fridge until we need it. And then we'll go ahead and grab that first piece on the sill pad and place that directly on the counter. Since the pan is going to get in the way of what we need to do next. And that would be to take our pizza cutter and trim off about an inch and a half from the bottom. And then we'll cut a piece off that piece to make the trunk. Which we will simply create by sticking that underneath. And with the excess you could if you want make a star, but I didn't. Okay, I didn't want to show off. And also I couldn't find my star cutter. But anyway, once our tree has been trunked, we'll go ahead and spread over our pesto sauce, except we will leave about a quarter inch of dough exposed around the outside, around the outside, around the outside. And by the way, the pesto is technically optional, and you can just make this with cheese, or you could use other sauces like tomato-based sauces or pepper-based sauces. Okay, so this part's up to you. I mean, you are after all the me of making this tree, but I really do like the look and flavor the pesto brings. And then once that's been sauced, we'll go ahead and grate over a generous amount of cheese, which in my case is going to be some Parmigiano-Reggiano. But of course, any other gratable cheese you like will work. Oh, and speaking of the holidays and cheese, if you're stuck for what to give someone as a gift, a big old hunk of imported Parmesan cheese is always an excellent idea. All right, you can get a really nice large piece for about $25. So keep that in mind if you get stuck. But anyway, regardless of what cheese you end up using, We'll go ahead and place over that second triangle of pastry and we'll do our best to stretch and pull and position it so it covers the first one, getting those edges lined up as evenly as we can. And if you have some extra dough like I did at the top, you can just yank that off. Or even better, grab the pizza wheel and trim it off. And since we're gonna cut and twist these two layers together, we don't really have to get a perfect seal on the edges, but I do like to press them together a little bit as well as sort of lightly press and pat that top layer pastry down into the cheese. And as I was finishing that step up, I realized I had some extra dough at the bottom that was hanging too far over and covering up my trunk. So I decided to trim some of that off, which for some reason I attempted to do with the pizza wheel, instead of a pair of scissors, which would have worked way better. But all's well that ends well. And for the next step, the pizza wheel is the perfect tool. And that's because what we'll do is make cuts from the bottom to the top about every three quarters of an inch or so, cutting almost, but not quite all the way to the center. All right, we wanna leave about a quarter to a half inch uncut in the middle, so this all stays together. And as we move up the tree and it gets kinda narrow, it's probably easier to start your cut in the center and move outward. And we'll go ahead and do that on both sides, making sure we line up those cuts the best we can. And then what we'll do once all those cuts have been made, we will simply take each section and twist it up like this. 
like maybe three or four times or whatever looks good to you. And as far as the direction for twisting, I think we should twist up towards the top of the tree, since branches and leaves always grow up towards the sun. Or am I overthinking this, and it really doesn't matter? All right, there's really no way to know. Oh, and if you're wondering if it would be easier to do two at once, well, it seems like it would be, but it's not really. I actually think it's probably faster to go one at a time and use both hands, until maybe we get near the top, where we're only going to be able to twist it like once anyway. And when we get to the very, very top, we probably can't twist it at all. Which is why when I got to the top, I just basically started mangling it into some kind of irregular shape, mirroring the random imperfections of nature. And once we're happy with our twisting and our mangling, we will take a little bit of extra pesto and spread some on that exposed dough in the center of the tree, as well as any other spots we feel need it. Oh, and as you work on this, keep a couple things in mind. Almost everything we do with dough or pastry looks amazing once it's cooked. And also, besides that, there is no such thing as a perfect tree. So what I'm trying to say is that as you make this, please relax. And at this point, we can go ahead and transfer that back onto our sheet pan. And we will finish this up with one more generous grating of cheese. And of course, if you want to get really creative here, you could punch out some circles of red pepper to make ornaments. Or maybe some anchovy tinsel. Alright, so as usual, feel free to make yours look way better than mine. And that's it. This is now ready to transfer into the center of a 425 degree oven for about 30 minutes or so, or until our puff pastry is fully cooked and very well browned and hopefully looking like this. And please listen carefully. The only way to screw this up is to undercook it. And culinarily speaking, there's absolutely nothing worse than undercooked puff pastry. It is pure evil. So basically we want to bake this as brown as possible. So do not take this out of the oven until you're sure it's done. And then before serving, I do like to let this cool for about 15 minutes, which we should do on a rack so we have some air circulation underneath, which will help prevent the dreaded soggy bottom. And that's it. After letting that cool down a little bit, we can transfer that onto some attractive surface or platter, possibly next to some spicy tomato sauce to use as a dip. And that, my friends, was one bent trunk away from being perfect. So if you'll excuse me, I'm going to fix that right now. And that's it. I think you know the rest. We'll go ahead and pull off pieces and enjoy. And forget how gorgeous and adorable this is and that it looks like a Christmas tree. This is just a delicious thing to eat. Okay, crispy, buttery, flaky puff pastry wrapped around cheese and pesto is an absolutely stellar combination. Whether we serve this with a dip or not. Although I have to say some type of dip is very nice. And because I'm home alone, I get to double and maybe even triple dip. And I'm not sure which part of the tree is more awesome. Those bigger, fatter bottom pieces that have a little more cheese and sauce in them. Or the branches at the top, which don't have quite as much stuff. Because that section was thinner, it cooked up extra crispy and crusty. And that cheese is caramelized magnificently. But happily, we don't have to pick. We can just eat some of both. But anyway, that's it. What I'm calling Cheese Twist Christmas Tree. Even though that's kind of hard to say. Especially after a couple eggnogs. But it is not hard to eat. It really is a proven crowd pleaser. Not to mention highly versatile. You could use this exact same technique with different fillings and different cheeses and different garnishes. And yes, of course you can also do sweet versions. So this really is something you can have a lot of fun with. But whether you experiment or not, or make it exactly as shown, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. How to make and serve a holiday cheese board. That's right, tis the season when we attempt to entertain impressively while using a minimum amount of effort. And whether it's for family coming over for a holiday feast or just a bunch of buddies coming over to watch the game, few things work as well for entertaining than an array of delicious cheeses. And while very simple to put together, there are some tips and tricks you should know, so I thought I would share my thought process behind putting one of these boards together. And first and foremost, that starts with our selection of cheese. So let's go ahead and begin with my first choice, which is a gorgeous soft French goat cheese that's made wrapped in chestnut leaves, which goes by the name of, I'm going to need the caption for this one, oh boy, goes by the name of Le Mothas Sir Fouille. Just kidding, I've been practicing. It's actually closer to Le Motisifoya. But anyway, I like to start off my cheese boards with something soft and earthy and creamy. 
And what I'll do for presentation's sake is go ahead and slice this in half to reveal that gorgeous white center. And yes, we're definitely going to serve it with those chestnut leaves intact for that extra little holiday touch. And we'll go ahead and place that in first position on our board because I always eat from left to right. And by the way, feel free to use a glass plate or platter, but because people are going to be slicing off pieces of this, I think the wood works so much better. It just sounds and feels a lot nicer. But anyway, let's move on to our second selection, Spain's famous manchego, which is a sheep's milk cheese. And manchego has a very distinctive waxy rind that features indentations made by the grass-woven baskets this is aged in. And while it's probably a good idea to trim that off, I do like to leave it on at least one side so people can see it. And then besides that, I'm also going to cut this one in half. Not to reveal anything, but just to make it a little more accessible when people are slicing. And we will go ahead and place that on our board in second position. Since that, in my opinion, is our second most intense cheese. Which brings us to our third and final selection. The world famous English Stilton. Which is made from the milk of cows. And as you can see, this is a blue cheese. Featuring all kinds of moldy veins. And since this wedge is exposed on all the other sides, we can leave this one side with a darker rind attached. But what I will do is take a knife and even up this front edge, for appearance sake, and also I really wanted to taste. And we'll go ahead and transfer that onto our board. And for me, three cheeses is the perfect number. All right, four is too many, it may confuse your guests, and two is just a couple cheeses. So I do suggest going with three varieties. And for me, the whole key to a successful cheese board is diversity. Okay, not only do we have cheese made from three different milks, but we have three cheeses that look completely different and feature different flavors and levels of intensity, as well as three different distinctive textures. And for me, it's that variety that makes for a great cheese board. And then above and beyond selection philosophy, the most important tip of all here is to let these cheeses sit out at room temp for at least an hour before you serve them. All right, there's a very old saying that I made up this week, and that's cold cheeses are not bold cheeses. So make sure you place these on your board at least an hour before your guests arrive. And then what we'll do while we're waiting is get our garnishes together. And this time I'm going to be going with some fresh grapes, as well as some dried plums, also sold under the far less sexy name of prunes. And then we'll do some seasonal fruit in the form of persimmons, which are very delicious, not to mention gorgeous. Just be sure you're using the Fuyu variety, since this is the non-astringent variety you can eat raw. And then besides that, I'm also going to go with some candied pecans, which will pair perfectly with our sharp, spicy Stilton. And then last but not least, I'm also going to do some Membrio, which is a paste made out of quince, which is basically a really large, almost inedible, giant mutant apple. But when it's cooked down to make this paste, it takes on this amazing fruity floral flavor. And it is the classic accompaniment to Manchego. So I'm going to go ahead and slice some of that up. At which point we can go ahead and arrange our garnishes on the board next to whatever cheese we think they pair best with. And while anything goes with anything here, next to the Stilton, I'm going to go with grapes and the candy nuts. Walnuts are actually a more classic choice, but the pecans work perfectly also. And then we'll go ahead and lay out some of our sliced membrio next to our manchego. And of course, these are just my suggested pairings, as there are so many different things you could go with instead. I mean, you are, after all, the Jesus of your cheeses. And you're the one that gets to decide how best to savor these. I mean, savor these. Which reminds me, I'm going with sort of a sweet and nutty, holiday dessertish type profile. But if you want to go with something more savory, you can do things like olives or marinated vegetables or pickles, mustard fruit, stuff like that. So those decisions are up to you and half the fun of doing a cheese board. But anyway, I went ahead and finished up with my dried prunes and freshly sliced persimmons. And if you can't find those, don't stress. Just go with some apples or pears. And then once our garnishes are set, that's it. We can go ahead and grab a few appropriate cheese knives with which to serve this with. And for the Stilton, we'll go with some kind of spreading knife, since it's kind of soft and sticky. But for the Manchego, we'll go with something that can slice and stab. And those holes you see are to reduce friction. Or maybe it's supposed to look like Swiss cheese. Maybe both. And then for our goat cheese, we'll go with a combination of a knife good for spreading, slicing, and stabbing. And then besides our utensils, the only other thing we're going to need would be some bread, crackers, and or crisps. And since I have three cheeses, I'm going to go with three selections. I have some sliced baguette for my Stilton, some very neutral, almost flavorless water crackers for my Manchego, and also some rustic rye crisps that I think are going to be perfect with my goat cheese. And finally, assuming our cheese is warmed up for at least an hour, 
we can start enjoying this professionally designed, thoughtfully composed cheese board. So I'm gonna go ahead and start off with my softest and mildest offering, which would be our French chestnut leaf wrap goat cheese, which as I mentioned should pair perfectly with this rye crisp, since it has a mild but sort of earthy flavor. And that really was an incredible bite, especially since we let that cheese warm up and all those flavors were able to develop. So do not rush your cheese board. And I went ahead and chased that with a slice of persimmon. And what about the prunes? No comment. And then I'll follow that up with a slice of manchego that if you haven't had before, you should taste on its own to appreciate its beautiful, slightly sweet, slightly tangy, nutty flavor. And for me, this is sort of right in the middle of the intensity scale between the mild goat cheese and the spicy Stilton. And then I'll enjoy some honor cracker, although way too little. That's why I'm only going to bite half. And we'll put another piece on this other half, along with the classic garnish of Membrillo. And the reason I want a neutral cracker is that combination is so insanely delicious, I don't want anything getting in the way. And I know I just said you could garnish with anything you want, but seriously, if you do the Manchego, get the Membrillo. And then I'll go ahead and finish up with my third and most intense selection, the very pungent and spicy Stilton, which I'm going to serve on baguette. And for me, those three bites in that order really highlight what a cheese board should be. And because our Stilton is so strongly flavored, that's why refreshing our palate with a sweet nut and a juicy tangy grape is the perfect way to go. And that will reset our palate and we can start all over again or switch it up and go in reverse order. But anyway, that's it. My approach to constructing and serving a cheese board. Okay, I don't want you to focus so much on the specific cheeses I used, but more so why I made the selections. All right, I wanted three different milks, three different textures, three different flavors, three different appearances, and so forth. And don't forget the people at the cheese shops love to help you put these things together. So take advantage of their expertise. But regardless of what you use, I really do hope you try to put your own cheese board together soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Pinecone cheese ball. That's right, tis the season of having to bring food to holiday parties. And this thing has it all. It's relatively inexpensive, it's fast and easy to make, and if other people brought regular cheese balls to the same party, you'll make them feel completely inferior, which really, you know, captures the holiday spirit. But anyway, let me show you how to put this together. It's as easy as it is visually impressive. So first up, you can't make a cheese ball without some kind of cheese spread. And for this, I'm gonna show you one of my favorites, a very simple herb and garlic spread, starting with cream cheese, the most popular and spreadable of all party cheeses. And to that, I'm gonna add a little bit of goat cheese. Maybe like four parts regular cream cheese to one part goat cheese. And that's going to add a little bit of extra flavor, a little bit of extra tang. And then to that, I'm going to add a little bit of garlic. You could definitely go roasted garlic here, which of course is going to be sweeter and more mild. We're also going to want to season this up with some freshly ground black pepper, a pinch of salt, and then we're going to make it rain cayenne. And then if we're going to call this a garlic and herb spread, we need some herbs. And I'm doing a trio of chopped herbs, Italian parsley, tarragon, and thyme. And pretty much anything's gonna work here except, ironically, rosemary. Even though we're gonna garnish with rosemary because it looks like pine needles, rosemary is a very, very strong resinous herb that generally doesn't work as well in spreads like this. It's just so easy for it to overpower everything else. But anyway, we're gonna need a whole bunch of fresh herb, and then all we need to do is take a spoon or a spatula, or in my case, a spoonula, and give this a very thorough mixing. And of course, this is gonna be a lot easier if your cheese is sort of room temperature. So give yourself a couple minutes, and mix this extra, extra thoroughly. Because if you don't, someone's gonna get a portion that has a lot of garlic, someone will get a portion that doesn't have any, and then they will argue later about whether it was too garlicky or not garlicky enough. And who needs that kind of drama at a holiday party? Okay, so mix it well. And once we do have that all combined and we've tasted it for seasoning, we'll go ahead and transfer a nice lump of that onto our serving platter and begin the shaping process. And you could just do this with a butter knife. Because I'm a fancy boy, I'm gonna use this little cheese spreader. And you don't exactly have to have the skills of Michelangelo here. As long as it's kind of wider at one end and kind of tapers down to a point at the other, that's fine. Keep in mind, you're gonna cover this with almond so it really doesn't have to be perfect. So I shaped and smoothed mine out to the general shape of a pine cone. And by the way, if you're thinking, man, that's so perfect, how did you get it so nice? I cheated. I used some PEPs, performance enhancing props. But anyway, you're gonna work your cheese spread into some kind of cone shape. And at that point, we're ready to apply the almonds. And you're gonna to wanna to start at the pointy end and work back to the bigger end. 
And any variety of whole almonds going to work here. I'm actually using something called sprouted almonds, which tend to be a little flatter and pointier, which I think look really good here. And there's really not a lot that can go wrong here as long as you got the pointy end sticking out and you're covering that cheese spread, you're doing a good job. And don't worry if it doesn't look awesome right away. When it first starts, it's going to look like something out of Jurassic Park. I'm no paleontologist, but I believe that's a cheesosaurus. But as you'll see, just keep sticking them in. And when you get to this point, you can make your rows a little neater. Of course, if you want to double your productivity, you can use both hands. But be careful. Do not pull a muscle. And we'll simply continue until we reach the back. And if you have to use a couple broken pieces to fill in the gaps, go ahead. And then once our cheese spread has been completely covered with almonds, it's basically done. Except, of course, we have to garnish with some rosemary to simulate pine needles. So we'll throw some rosemary sprigs on there. And that holiday-inspired pine cone cheese ball is done. Check it out. I mean, that thing's so realistic, you're going to have to tell people it's okay to eat. And even if this didn't taste great, it would still be a huge hit just because of its appearance. But it does taste great. So let me go in here for a taste, which is going to be a little bit of a challenge. Because I want to taste this, but I also want to be able to bring it to a party later. So I'm basically going to dig some out, taste it, and then put this back together. And yes, as predicted, that was delicious. Herby, garlicky, creamy, with like I said, just that little hint of tanginess from the goat cheese. Just a beautiful cheese spread. So let me go ahead and put this back together. And if you're thinking, ooh, you touched those almonds. Yeah, I know. I touched every one of those almonds. So we'll put that back together. And there we go. The perfect crime. So anyway, if you were stuck wondering, what the heck am I going to bring to that holiday party? This is what you're going to bring. So I really do hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info, as usual. And as always, enjoy. Panettone. That's right, I'm very excited to show you my very first attempt ever at making panettone. And I'll admit to being a little bit intimidated, because from what I read, this is supposed to be one of the hardest breads in the world to make. In fact, one article compared it to climbing Mount Everest, which sounds a little dramatic. I mean, I don't think there's dozens of people that die each year making this bread, or at least not suddenly. But anyway, as you'll see, this came out really well. So this is either easier than people say, or I had a good amount of beginner's luck. But either way, let's go ahead and get started by starting the starter, which we're going to need to make the day before. And we'll do that by mixing some flour and water together to which we're going to add some of our already made sourdough starter. And we'll go ahead and stir that together. And I hope you have some of that in your fridge, but if you don't, in the blog post I'm going to tell you how to make it without it. And what we'll do once that's mixed is go ahead and cover it, and just leave it out at room temp overnight. And not only is this mixture going to add some volume and flavor to our dough, it's also, believe it or not, going to help the finished loaf stay fresher longer. And then once that's set, we should move on to the other thing we should do the day before. And that would be to soak some chopped up dried fruit in some type of liquor. Okay, I'm using white rum. And as far as my fruit selection, I went with pineapple, cherry, and golden raisin. But there are so many other things you could use. So feel free to investigate other options. You are, after all, the James Comey of your panettone. But anyway, we'll go ahead and mix that up the night before. And let that fruit absorb the booze, stirring occasionally. And then once those two things are set, the next day we can actually move on to making the dough which will begin by dissolving a package of yeast in some very warm but not too hot water. And as usual, we'll let that sit for about 10 minutes before adding the following ingredients. All right, to that we're going to add a couple eggs, as well as some white sugar. We'll also toss in a spoon of pure vanilla extract, as well as some freshly grated orange and lemon zest. And then for whatever reason, I decided to take a whisk and give this a mix before adding our starter and flour. You probably don't have to, but it's too late now. And once I had done that, I went ahead and grabbed my starter from the day before, which looked beautifully bubbly and smelled amazing. And what we'll do is give that a stir and dump it into our mixing bowl. And like I said, if you don't have some sourdough starter, don't worry. I'll tell you in the blog post how to make a cheater version. But anyway, we'll go ahead and dump that in, at which point we'll go ahead and finish this off by adding our flour. And I'm just using all-purpose here, although some recipes do call for bread flour. And at this point, we'll grab our dough hook and start kneading this in our stand mixer. Although as soon as I lowered that hook in, I realized I forgot the salt. So I stopped and added it, because you never, ever want to forget the salt. And then what we're going to do is let this knead for a long time, like for 10 minutes or so, until we've achieved a very, very smooth, very, very elastic dough. And early on, if you need to stop it and scrape down the sides, go ahead. But like I said, we'll let this knead for about 10 minutes, until we've created something that looks like this. 
All right, like I said, very smooth and very elastic. And if we pull that dough with our spatula, it should sort of snap back into place. And then once that's been accomplished, we'll go ahead and add our room temperature butter. Okay, ice cold's not gonna work here. Make sure it's room temp. And we're gonna need that for another five minutes or so, or until that butter is completely mixed in. And we've created once again a very smooth, very elastic, somewhat shiny dough. And once again, you might have to turn off the machine a couple times and scrape down the sides until it all starts to come together. So this is what mine looked like about five minutes later. So yes, we are talking about a very, very soft, somewhat sticky dough here, which is probably one of the reasons people say this is a hard bread to make. All right, generally people are scared of really soft doughs, but don't be, you'll be fine. But anyway, let me go ahead and transfer that onto my work surface so you can get a better look. And then what I did using some slightly damp fingers, as well as the help of my bench scraper, is sort of wrestle and fold that a few times into some sort of dough ball shape. And by the way, one way you can tell if you've developed enough gluten is that you can stretch it so thin you can see light through it without it tearing, which they call the window pane test, because you're supposed to stretch it out between two figures in front of a window. But I'm not going to, because I can tell just by pinching and stretching like this. And then what I did is transfer that back into my bowl that I didn't even bother cleaning out. I usually do, but I didn't feel like it. And then what we'll do is cover that and let it rise until doubled, which is gonna take a while. Okay, these rich doughs rise pretty slowly. So mine actually took about three hours, which was totally worth the wait, if for no other reason just the feeling you get when you punch it down. Man, that feels good. And what we'll wanna do at this point is transfer that back onto our table. And then once deflated, again using some damp fingers in our bench scraper, we will fold that back into some kind of ball of shape. Because what we're gonna to need to do is transfer this into a plastic bag and refrigerate it overnight. Oh yeah, we're talking about a three day bread here. All right, so if you want this bread today, you have to start it two days ago. But anyway, trust me, it'll be worth the wait. So I went ahead and transferred that into a plastic bag and popped it in the fridge overnight. And by the way, we're not just doing this stuff to make you wait for nothing. All right, this overnight fermentation in the fridge really does improve the flavor and probably texture. So I did pop mine in the fridge overnight and then pulled it out the next morning, at which point it looked like this. And what we'll do is go ahead and remove the bag. I just rip it open. I know some of you would wash this and reuse it, but I don't swing that way. And then what we'll do is go ahead and press this out into some sort of square rectangle shape. And because the dough is nice and cold and that butter is stiffened up, it's a little easier to work with. And then once I get it to about this flatness, I'll sprinkle it with a little bit of flour and then roll it out a little thinner with my rolling pin. And the whole reason we're doing this is that so we can scatter over our boozy dried fruit and then roll this up. And theoretically, that way, all our fruit will be evenly distributed. So I went ahead and applied my dried fruit to the surface, which by now had absorbed all that rum. But I ended up not using it all, because as I was doing this, I was thinking, man, this is like way too much fruit. So I actually only ended up using about three quarters of it, which as you'll see in the final shots, probably wasn't the best idea. I probably should have used it all. But anyway, once that was spread out, like I said, we'll go ahead and roll the dough up nice and tight. And please accept my apologies for the blurriness. See, that's one of the reasons I've never won an Oscar. So let's fast forward. And then once that's been rolled up, I went ahead and rolled both ends up towards the middle, attempting somehow to get it back into some kind of round shape. And if at all possible, try to end up with a good amount of dough on the top. Okay, so I sort of worked that around until like I said, I ended up with some kind of smooth dough over the top. And then once that's been accomplished, what we need to do is transfer this into a paper panettone mold, which come in this shape, the shorter, wider one, as well as a tall, skinny version. And yes, of course, in the blog post, I'm gonna tell you where to find those. And then what we'll need to do is cover this and let it rise until it's at least two thirds of the way up the sides, which because we're starting with cold dough, is gonna take like three or four hours. But don't go by time, go until it looks like this. And by the way, a few hours in, I took off the plastic because it was touching the top and it was kind of sticking and I got scared. You can see the market left right there. But anyway, the point is let your dough proof in this mold until it looks like this. At which point we will carefully brush the surface with an egg wash, which is one egg beaten with a splash of water. And then once that's been applied to the entire surface, we will take a razor or a sharp knife and cut across into the top about a quarter to a half inch down, which is not just done to make this look really cool, although that's a big part of it. We actually need to do that so it rises properly and we achieve that beautiful signature dome shape. So we'll go ahead and slice the top just like that. 
And then our last official act before this goes in the oven is to place a small piece of butter right in the middle, which is probably more traditional than practical, since I doubt that's going to make much of a difference. But do it anyway. And that's it. We are finally ready to bake. So we will go ahead and transfer that into the center of a 350 degree oven for about 40 to 45 minutes or until it looks like this, which would be beautifully browned and spectacularly gorgeous. I mean, look at that. That was so beautiful. I didn't even really care how this tasted. And then if you're thinking, hey, this is probably ready to eat right now. Well, unfortunately, you could not be more wrong. We actually need to let this cool for two hours upside down. Oh yeah, you heard me. Which is why I'm going to poke in two skewers on either side and then flip this over onto a panettone cooling hole, which I had cut into my table. But if you don't happen to have access to a panettone cooling hole, you can just flip this over on top of a Dutch oven or a stock pot, or something like that. And by cooling this upside down, there's not going to be any collapsing and it's going to help us retain a beautiful light texture. So take that gravity. And then after somehow waiting for a couple hours for this to fully cool, we will go ahead and pull out those skewers and finally be able to cut in and see how we did. So I went ahead and sliced out a wedge. And like I said, this looks so magnificent. I really didn't care how it tasted, but I'm very happy to report for a first attempt, it tasted really good, which didn't really surprise me. What did surprise me was how amazing the texture was for a first attempt. Okay, it was rich and buttery, but it was just impossibly light and airy. The only major surprise was where the heck did all that fruit go? I thought I had way too much and ended up thinking I didn't have enough. But anyway, besides that, I was extremely happy and went ahead and cut another piece so I could try some with butter, which is even a better way to enjoy this. And for whatever reason, I found this shape to be more enjoyable than the wedge. So I'm going to suggest you cut yours in half and then down into slices. And while this bread was great plain and even better spread with butter, I'm going to show you a third and what I consider ultimate way to enjoy this. And that would be lightly toasted with butter. Okay, that really is the ultimate way to enjoy this bread. Preferably with a nice hot cup of coffee. But anyway, that's it. My first attempt at panettone. Yes, it took three days and many hours. But as far as actual work involved, there really wasn't that much. And like I said, I was really happy with how this came out. Although next time I am going to add all the fruit and maybe make a few tweaks, which you'll read about on the blog post. But bottom line, this was not even close to as hard as people made it out to be. So for that reason and many others, I really do hope you give this a try soon. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Potato pancakes, one of my favorite potato preparations. It's something I just don't make often enough. Super easy to make, take two pounds, actually I had two and a quarter, two pounds of russet potatoes, peel them, and then grate them with a cheese grater into a bowl of very cold water. And I'm also gonna grate in half an onion into the same bowl. And by the way, you've never cried until you've grated onion. It's, good. it's a good cry. All right, once that's done, I'm gonna add some more water, fill it up a little more. And these are just gonna sit in the cold water for about 20, 30 minutes. You don't need to rinse it, just let them sit there. In the meantime, take a couple eggs, some flour, black pepper, a little pinch of cayenne, salt of course, and we're gonna whisk that up until very smooth, and then set that aside. When our potatoes are ready, drain them, rinse them, put them in a colander and squeeze, 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 squeeze. All the water must be squeezed out. So I squeeze it a fistful at a time, and then I press it again with some paper towel. And make sure all the water is out of your potatoes. It's the only way to screw this up, is to have wet potatoes. Once the potatoes are as dry as humanly possible, add them to a bowl, mix in your egg mixture with a spatula, and that is a potato pancake mixture ready to fry. It's an incredibly easy recipe, I told you. I'm gonna cover that while I make these because you don't want any air to get to the potatoes if possible, because they do oxidize. This is not something you could store, put away, and it, you know it's gonna be good the next day. So you're gonna wanna make this stuff fresh. All right, now to fry these, we're gonna use a heavy duty skillet with a good amount of oil. They say a quarter inch of oil. I don't know if you quite need that much on the bottom, but you need enough oil to come up the side, at least halfway up the pancake, if you want a nice crispy cake. This one I'm just doing a little test to taste for salt. We're gonna heat the pan on medium high, and when it's hot, add your pancake mixture, flatten it out, 
This one's a little smaller than the ones you're going to see. But again, I'm just tasting for seasoning. I'm going to taste this. Oh man, so good. And it did need a little more seasoning. So what you want to do is you want to put your oil in the pan, heat it to medium high. When it starts to shimmer, add your potatoes, flatten them down a little bit. They don't have to be round. Who says they have to be round? If I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times. The kitchen is no place for a perfectionist. All right, flatten them down to about a half inch. Cook them for about, like I said, five minutes per side. You want to see the edges get really crispy and crunchy before you turn them. Five minutes on the other side. And when I flip them, normally I'll turn it down to medium. Because this is raw potato, you got to give it time to cook through. If you keep going on high heat or medium high the whole way, sometimes towards the end, the edges start getting a little too brown and the middle isn't quite tender enough. And there you go. I top mine with smoked salmon, sour cream, and dill. Very classic combination. You can do these with applesauce and sour cream. Another even more classic combination. Or just plain next to some eggs and bacon. Anyway, go to the site. The ingredients for the filling are quite important. So go check those out. And as always, enjoy. Rosemary and honey pull apart dinner rolls. That's right, when those fancy holiday meals roll around, you can't just put any kind of roll on the table. You have to make something special, and these are kind of special. And if you thought these were too complicated or hard to make, well, think again. These are actually quite simple to make, and here's how you do it. So we're gonna start by putting one package of dry active yeast in the bowl of our stand mixer, and then we're gonna pour over a quarter cup of very warm but not too hot water. All right, as you know, if it's too hot, it will kill the yeast. So just give that a stir, and we're just going to let that sit there for about 10-15 minutes, and what will happen is it will start getting foamy and thick, and you know that the yeast is alive and it's all good in the microorganism hood, okay? So we're going to set that aside, we're going to go over to the stove, where I'm going to have you over low heat melt some butter in some milk. So put the heat on low, and just let it sit there until the butter almost melts, just like that, and then just turn it off. Alright, we just want that tepid, just barely warm. Again, if it's too hot, you're going to kill the yeast. So just set that aside. We're gonna go back over to the mixing bowl and we're gonna to look to see if the yeast is alive, and mine is. See how it's kind of thick and foamy and bubbly? That means the yeast is living. So to that, we're gonna add some honey. It's gonna give the rolls a little bit of sweetness. I usually put about a tablespoon. If you wanted a little sweeter, you could put two tablespoons. We're also gonna throw in some salt and some finely minced rosemary. All right, not a ton. Rosemary is very strong. So be careful not to overdo it. And then we're gonna dump in our flour, but not all of it like 75% of it, and why not all of it? Because I'll explain in a minute. And then finally dump in your warm milk butter mixture. We're gonna throw that on the mixer with a dough hook, because we're making dough. We're gonna give that a mix, and it's gonna be way too sticky to form a dough, but that's good. Because what we wanna do is just gradually add flour until it just pulls away from the sides. So after that initial mixing, you can see it's super sticky and way too wet. I'm gonna dump in flour about a quarter cup at a time. I'll let it turn for a minute. I'll scrape down the side and I'll keep doing that until this happens, until the dough has absorbed enough flour where it just barely pulls away from the sides. It's still very soft, it's still very sticky, but there is enough flour in there that this will pull together into a dough ball. Once that happens, you're gonna let that knead for about six minutes until you have a very elastic and again, soft, slightly sticky dough. All right, when you pull it out of the bowl, it should be slightly tacky, but not enough where it's gonna stick to your fingers. If it does, add a little more flour and knead it more. But that's perfect right there. I'm gonna douse that with some olive oil a good amount. I'm gonna make sure it's totally coated. We're gonna cover that with foil and put it in a warm spot for about an hour and a half to two hours until it doubles in size. And you'll know because it'll be like twice as big. All right, so that's looking good. For me, that was about an hour and 40 minutes. We're gonna dump that onto our cutting board. Now you'll notice I don't have any flour down because that dough still has a good amount of oil on it, so it's really not that sticky. If you're scared, you can rub a little bit of olive oil on your board in your hands. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna form that into a rectangle, but only to help us portion these dinner rolls. If you want, you could just start pulling off pieces and making the balls, but I find it easier to make a rectangle. Then I'll cut it in equal size strips. And if I cut each strip into the same number of pieces, I know each of my rolls will be basically the same size. All right, so nothing too complicated. It just helps you portion. And of course, at this point, I will note, you can make these any size you want, as long as they're the same size, so they bake the same. And then once your dough is portioned, you're simply gonna take each piece and form it into a small ball. And how you wanna do this, you wanna fold the four corners up underneath itself, so you're keeping a nice smooth surface, 
and you're pulling and pinching that dough towards the bottom so the seams will be underneath and the top will be a perfectly smooth sphere. And just as a side note, sometimes when I'm doing this balling, I will also do a little bit of shot calling, but that's only if I have time, all right? Once those are all balled up, we're gonna carefully place those on a lined baking sheet. We want nice, neat rows and columns. And you'll notice they're almost, but not quite touching. And this is very critical if you want the pull apart effect, all right? If you put them too far away, you're just gonna have little rolls, not the same deal. All right, you wanna call these pull apart rolls, you better have something to pull apart. So we wanna get them very close, but not quite touching. You can see right there, that's kind of the perfect distance. All right, once those are on the pan, we're gonna take an egg wash, which in my case was just a beaten egg with about a teaspoon of milk. I'm gonna paint that over the top. It's gonna to give them a beautiful color. And then last but not least, we're gonna take some coarse sea salt and just sprinkle a few crystals on each roll. Again, we're doing this to up the fancy quotient because this is a special occasion roll. And then once those have the salt, the last step before baking is called the proofing, which means we gotta let these rise for about 20, 30 minutes. I just put mine in the oven, the oven's off of course. So I put them in the oven for about a half hour, after which they look like this. So I don't know if they're gonna double in size, but they're gonna be significantly larger. I'm gonna take those out, I'm gonna leave them on top of the stove while we preheat our oven to 375. When the oven's preheated, put those in the center and bake them for 20 minutes until beautifully browned. They're gonna look like this, which I think looks spectacular. You can see the egg wash gave them that gorgeous color. That salt really does give them an extra special look. By the way, if you wanted to use sesame seeds or poppy seeds, you could put that on instead of the salt. And of course you can serve these warm, but don't serve them hot. But I'm gonna pull one off here hot so I could burn my finger. But anyway, let me crack this open so you can see the gorgeous inside. Just a very classic white light dinner roll. I don't have any food to eat these with, so I'm just gonna put a little piece of butter on there. Oh yeah. Just pure unadulterated deliciousness. And it has that gorgeous aroma of rosemary, that subtle sweetness from the honey. Just a very, very excellent dinner roll. And how many people would really know the difference that you made these from scratch and didn't buy a package of frozen rolls? Who cares? That's not the point. We don't make these to impress other people. We make these to impress ourselves. And of course, other people. Anyway, as you saw, there's really not a lot of work involved in these, so I really hope you give them a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Lasagna. That's right, I'm finally making lasagna. It's been requested so many times, and because it's such a popular Italian-American holiday tradition, I thought this would be the perfect time to do it. So for me, there are two keys to a great lasagna, a fantastic meat sauce, and a great cheese filling. So first things first. So for the meat sauce, I'm gonna take some Italian sausage and ground beef. We're gonna put that over medium heat, and while it's browning, we're gonna break it up into as small a pieces as possible. While that's browning, I'm gonna take some mushrooms and give them a really rough chop. Okay, don't worry about them all being the same size. Those are gonna break down in the sauce anyway. So I'm gonna add those to my browning meat. All right, go ahead and stir those in. I'm also gonna add some salt, some black pepper, and some red chili flakes. Okay, so at this point, I want you to turn the heat to medium high and cook it until the meat's browned and any liquid that came out of the mushrooms has evaporated. So you see this, the meat's browned and the bottom of the pan is pretty much dry. And at that point, we're gonna add our prepared marinara sauce. Am I using homemade? Well, I'm not at liberty to say. But you can use just about anything here. Homemade, jarred sauce, as long as it's good quality, not a problem, all right? You saw me add a splash of water there. If you're using jarred sauce, make sure you rinse the jars with water. And then we're gonna bring that to a simmer, turn it down to low, and simmer for hours. How long exactly? I don't know. It should simmer until the meat is extremely, extremely tender. All right, I did mine about two hours. You wanna make sure you add a little more water along the way if it's getting too thick. And once it's done and you're happy with the texture, turn it off, taste for salt and pepper, and set it aside. All right, so that's half the battle. Our beautiful meat sauce is ready. On to the cheese filling, which is simply a couple beaten eggs, some ricotta cheese, and not that skim milk stuff, the real whole milk variety. For this recipe, you just need the highest quality cheeses possible. Will people know? I don't care. I will know, and you will know. So after that, we're gonna add our Reggiano Parmesan and fresh mozzarella. Now you notice how it's diced and not grated? You shouldn't be able to grate good, soft, fresh mozzarella. In fact, there's an old saying, if you can use a grater, you should be a hater. All right, so use that nice, fresh, soft mozzarella. They have it in stores now, use it. We're also gonna add some salt and pepper. 
and cayenne. And then last but not least, some fresh Italian parsley and give that a good mix. So like I said earlier, if you have a great meat sauce and a really great cheese filling, you are going to have a fantastic lasagna. There's no way not to. So before we can assemble this, of course we have to boil one box, one pound lasagna noodles. All right, make sure you're using salted water. Now this is the only time ever, except for maybe pasta salad, where I'm gonna tell you when the pasta is cooked, drain it, rinse it, and keep it in cold water. All right, so you see that here? My noodles are ready, and it's time for final assembly. And yes, in case you're wondering, I have tried using the raw noodles, not boiling them first. I don't like that method. All right, let's talk about the pan. This is not something that goes in your wimpy little 9 by 13 casserole dish. This needs a lasagna pan. 10 by 15 by like 3 inches deep is perfect. All right, so get yourself a nice lasagna pan. Now, assembly is super easy if you can do some simple math. Divide your sauce into four parts, your noodles into three parts, and your cheese into two parts. So one-fourth of the sauce goes down. On top of that, one-third of the noodles. All right, I had 18 noodles, so I used six. Okay, so once the first third of the noodles are down, the base of our lasagna is done, and we're ready for the first half of the cheese mixture. All right, so divide that perfectly in half, spread that cheese mixture out onto the noodles, and then top with another portion of the meat sauce. All right, so once that's spread nice and even, we are gonna take the second third of our noodles, place those over, and as long as it's covered, you're good. Don't worry about what it looks like. Don't worry if you got a couple broken ones. It's all good when it bakes. So the second layer of noodles are down. The last of the cheese mixture gets spread on there. I don't know about you, but I'm getting kind of excited. On top of the cheese, just like our last layer, goes the meat sauce. At this point, we're gonna give it a little shake to settle it. And yes, the old tapa tapa. And to finish this beauty off, the last of the noodles go over the top. You can see the end there. I just pieced together some of the smaller broken pieces. Doesn't matter. Relax. Once this cooks, it all looks fantastic. All right, over that goes the last fourth of the meat sauce. Spread that over. Make sure all the noodles are covered. I'm going to dot that with more fresh mozzarella. We're going to finish with some more grated Parmesan cheese. Cover it loosely with foil. I don't want the foil touching the cheese, but I do want it covered. I'm going to put it on a sheet pan in case I have any spillover. I'm going to put that in a 375 degree oven for 30 minutes. At that point, take off the foil. Continue cooking for about another 30-35 minutes until it's done. And when it's done, it will be golden brown. It will be bubbling and it will be hot all the way through. What a gorgeous, gorgeous lasagna, if I do say so myself. And I know you can't wait to tear into this, but let it sit for at least 20 minutes. It's just going to be too hot to enjoy unless you do. All right. But after that, all bets are off. Cut it into nice squares. You'll get like 12 decent portions out of this or like nine huge ones. You can see all those beautiful layers, that super meaty sauce with the sausage and the beef and the mushrooms adding a little bit of extra something. The beautiful cheeses. So, so delicious. So whether you're serving this for your Italian-American Christmas dinner or just any time, I hope you give this recipe a try. So go to the site. All the ingredients are there for the sauce, for the filling, for the whole thing. And as always, enjoy. Tortier. That's right. The culinary school I attended was very close to the Canadian border. And sometimes we would cross that border in search of two things, neither of which was this amazing meat pie. Okay, it was actually beer and a very specific type of dance performance. But nevertheless, I did enjoy tortillere on numerous occasions. And since it is a very traditional French-Canadian holiday dish, I thought the timing was perfect to show you how to put one of these together. And to get started with that, we're going to need some kind of pie dough, which I'm going to go through very quickly, since we've done this in like half a dozen videos. So in a food processor, I have some all-purpose flour, which I'm going to combine with a spoon of salt and two sticks of butter that I've cut up and placed in the freezer so that it's very, very cold and very hard. And what I'm going to do is blitz that on and off for about a half a minute or so, or until our butter's been reduced to the size of peas, give or take. And once that's been accomplished, we'll go ahead and drizzle in some nice cold fresh water that we spiked with a little bit of white vinegar. And then we'll go ahead and pulse that on and off until our mixture basically resembles very coarse breadcrumbs. Okay, we don't want to do this until it comes together in a dough ball. That's too far. And by the way, this is in real time, so it's not going to take long. 
And if this mixture contains enough moisture, you should be able to press some together and it should hold together like this. All right, let me give you a better look at that. Okay, can you see that? That's perfect. And then what we'll do once that's happened is go ahead and transfer this onto our work surface and basically press it together into a lump of dough. And the reason this works so much better is if you wait for the dough ball to come together in the food processor, it can get overworked. So this way we're accomplishing the same thing without overmixing. And by avoiding that, we're hopefully gonna end up with a very tender and very flaky crust. And then once all that's been pressed together, we'll go ahead and wrap that in plastic and pop it in the fridge for at least one hour or until we're ready to use it. All right, as far as workability goes, cold pie dough is always much, much easier than warm pie dough. So we'll pop that in the fridge and move on to our urban spice blend. So into this bowl, we're gonna combine some kosher salt, some freshly ground black pepper, some dried sage, some dried thyme, some cinnamon, some ground ginger, some freshly grated nutmeg, some allspice, some dry mustard, and some ground clove. And then last but not least, everybody's favorite, a little bit of cayenne, which I don't think they add in Quebec, but that's okay. We're allowed to. We are, after all, the mayor of our tortier. And then once we have that together, we can go ahead and start cooking, which will begin by adding some diced onions to some butter over medium heat, along with a pinch of salt. And we'll go ahead and cook those stirring. And we usually just do this until the onions soften and turn translucent, but not this time. We're actually gonna cook these over medium until they turn to a nice golden brown. Okay, so we're gonna get a little more color on them than usual. And then while our onions are cooking, simultaneously, we're also gonna boil a peeled quartered potato in some salted water until very tender. And as usual, we'll be testing for doneness by giving it the old polka polka with a knife. But once tender, instead of draining this, we'll actually use a strainer to scoop these potatoes out into a bowl because we need to reserve this cooking liquid. Repeat, do not throw away the potato water. And you'll see why momentarily. And then what we'll do while our potatoes are hot is mash them up and then simply reserve those until needed, which is gonna be in about 45 minutes to an hour. And at this point, we'll go back and check our onions, which like I said, we wanna to cook to a beautiful golden brown. So those are looking just about right. And at this point, we can go ahead and add some crushed garlic, as well as some finely diced celery, and our already prepped holiday spice blend. And we'll go ahead and stir that in and cook this for about one minute. All right, that's just gonna wake up the spices and infuse that butter with all these wonderful flavors. And then once that's set, we can go ahead and add whatever meat we're using, which for me is equal parts ground pork and ground beef. Okay, veal is also a very popular choice. And then remember when I told you to save that potato water? That's because we're gonna add a couple ladles of it here. And I'm not measuring exactly, but that's probably about three quarters of a cup. And then what we're gonna to wanna to do is take a completely normally sized wooden spoon and sort of mix and mash this all together. And what that potato water is gonna do is help us turn this into a paste, all right? We do not want chunks of meat here, all right? We want something that has a very fine texture. So we'll go ahead and work that over with our spoon until like I said, we've achieved a paste-like texture. And then all we're gonna do is let this cook on medium, stirring occasionally for about 45 minutes or so, or until our meat is nice and tender and most of the liquid is evaporated. And by the way, as this cooks, if you wanna spoon off some of that fat that pools at the top, feel free. I did a little bit, but we do need some of that to keep this nice and moist and succulent. So you be the judge. But anyway, like I said, we're gonna cook that for about 45 minutes or so until our meat gets nice and tender and extremely paste-like. And as I said, most of that liquid gets evaporated. All right, we don't want the mixture to get super dry. It should stay relatively moist and juicy. But if we drag our spoon across the bottom, that space should not fill in quickly with liquid. And if it does, just raise your heat up a little bit and cook it a little more. And conversely, if it dries out too quick, just go ahead and add another splash of your potato water. And then what we'll do once we think our mixtures cook long enough is go ahead and add and stir in our potato, which along with that natural sticky goodness from the meat is what's gonna hold our pie together. So we'll go ahead and stir that in until combined, at which point we're gonna turn off our heat and let this cool down to room temp. Or at least that's what my French Canadian friends insist on. I'm not sure what happens if you make the pie with this mixture still hot. And if you wanna take a chance, go for it. But I'm gonna go ahead and let mine cool. And once it does, we are ready to fill our crust which is our next and almost last step. 
So on a flour surface, I'm going to go ahead and roll out half our dough to make the bottom crust. And I say half, but it's really closer to like 55 or 60% of it. Since for a deep dish pie, we do need a little more dough for the bottom than the top. But anyway, I'm going to go ahead and roll that out to about an eighth of an inch thick. And then we will roll that up on our pin to make it easier to transfer into our dish. And we'll go ahead and make sure that's nicely settled in. And we have plenty of dough here, so don't stretch it out across the bottom. All right, you always want to sort of adjust it down from the sides. And then once that's set, we'll go ahead and roll out the rest of the dough for the top. And once the top crust is done, we're going to have to make some sort of vents, which you can just do by making some slashes with a knife. But I'm actually going to take one of these decorative star-shaped cutters and press out a nice festive looking hole from the center. And that will allow steam to escape so our pie doesn't explode. And then once that's set, we can go ahead and transfer in our filling, making sure to pack it down pretty good, as well as smooth out the top. And then once our filling's in before we put the top crust on, we'll want to go around and paint the edge with some egg wash, which is just one large egg beaten with a tablespoon of water. And we'll go ahead and apply that all the way around before placing our dough on top, hopefully centering our vent if we made one. And if you didn't, like I said, you could just make some slashes with your knife. And then what we'll do once we've gone around pressing that together is trim off the excess dough, which instead of doing across the top edge of the dish, which we sometimes do, I'm actually going to angle the knife and go around the bottom rim of the dish so that I have plenty of dough to crimp together. All right, for this pie, I want a nice big thick crust to pair with all that nice big thick meat. And then once that's trimmed, we'll go ahead and crimp the edge which as you can see is done simply by pressing one finger in between two fingers, going all the way around, which is not only the easiest way to crimp, it also in my opinion makes one of the best looking edges. And then we'll finish this up by egg washing it all over, including and especially our crimping. And that's it. Once our pie's been egg washed, it's ready to transfer into the center of a 375 degree oven for about an hour or until beautifully browned, and hopefully looking very close to something like this. Oh yeah, that is one handsome looking tortier. And I'd love to tell you we could eat it right now, but it is highly recommended you let this cool down. All right, the consensus is that room temp's the best, or maybe just slightly, slightly warm. But for whatever reason, this is rarely served piping hot, probably because it's harder to taste, and may actually crumble apart. So we really should let this cool down, but I was losing light, not to mention starving. So I took my chances cutting a slice while it was still pretty warm. And I'm happy to report it actually worked out pretty well. And after just a few seconds of pushing things back in place, I ended up with a pretty nice looking slice. And I know what you're thinking. There's no way the first one came out that good. You probably cut three or four and used the nicest one. Well, check it out. Take that, skeptics. But anyway, the point is, let it cool. The texture will set up a lot better. And while some folks like to serve this with beef gravy, or believe it or not, ketchup, I feel that if properly made, you really don't need anything. That filling is just so meaty and savory, and beautifully scented with all those warm holiday spices. Just extremely flavorful and satisfying. Of course, having said that, I never remember turning down gravy. So I guess if someone offered, I would try it but this is perfectly scrumptious as is. And not to brag, but that crust came out absolutely perfect. Which reminds me to remind you, make sure you bake this long enough until it's nicely browned. Okay, we really do need that bottom crust to turn golden. And this one certainly did. But anyway, that's it. My take on Tortier. I really did enjoy everything about this, as well as the memories it brought back of my trips to Montreal during culinary school. And I know I still have to do a poutine video. But anyway, in the meantime, whether it's for a holiday celebration or not, I really do hope you give this amazing meat pie a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Honey glazed ham. That's right, twas the week before Christmas and all through the web, people were asking, Hey, how do you do the ham glaze that looks awesome, tastes awesome, and caramelizes to a crispy, crackling finish? Well, that's what I'm about to show you, and it's way easier than you think. And by the way, I'm just doing a half ham here, but this amazing technique will work no matter what size or style your ham. 
So let's go ahead and get started by setting up our roasting pan. So yes, you're going to need a roasting pan big enough to fit your ham, preferably it comes with a rack. And what we're going to do here is toss in a couple whole star anise and a bunch of whole cloves. And I know traditionally the cloves are stuck in the ham, but is there anything worse to bite into than a whole clove? Actually, you know what? Don't answer that. But the point is I hate to bite into cloves. So with this method, we're actually going to flavor the ham from underneath. Because what we're going to do is pour in some water. And not only is that water going to make for a beautifully moist roasting environment, but thanks to our spices, it's also going to flavor the meat. Plus, you know what else that water does? It makes cleanup a breeze. Sorry, I'm just practicing for when I get kicked off YouTube. And I have to do infomercials on late night basic cable. But anyway, we're going to put in about an inch of water. And then we'll put our rack in and place our ham on top of that. And if the outside of your ham is kind of wet and or slimy, go ahead and pat it dry with some paper towels. And then it's time for a very easy yet critical step. We have to score the ham with a knife. And all that means is taking something sharp and make cuts all over this about a half inch apart, about a quarter inch deep. And of course we want to score it across. We want to score it up and down, but it really doesn't matter as long as you slash that surface all over, that's going to help the flavor of our glaze permeate the meat. And typically hams like this don't come with a lot of fat, but don't worry, like I said, just cut down about a quarter inch into whatever you have. And once that's done, we're going to go ahead and place that in the center of a 325 degree oven for 20 minutes. All right, so we're just going to give this a little head start while we make our glaze, which is ridiculously simple. So in a mixing bowl, we're going to take a whole bunch of brown sugar. Ironically, one of the secrets to a great honey glaze is not to use too much honey. So we're going to use mostly brown sugar, but of course, we're also going to add some honey. Okay, so we got our brown sugar and our honey for our sweet. Now for our tangy, we're going to go with some Dijon mustard and a splash of rice vinegar. And then, of course, we're going to season this up with some cayenne pepper and a whole bunch of freshly ground black pepper. And then last but not least, a few dashes of Worcestershire sauce. And no salt, by the way. Oh, the ham has plenty of salt. And then we'll simply take a whisk and give this a mix, which is not going to be easy. This is a very thick, pasty glaze. One of the keys here is keeping this very, very thick, okay? So I give it a little mix. If it seems too thick, which it did, we'll add just another little splash of rice vinegar and give it another mix. And we'll do that until we have something that looks like this. So we're just adding enough rice vinegar to make this brushable which you can see right here is I actually stick my pastry brush in. So that right there is the consistency you should be shooting for. Do not go any thinner than that, okay? So our glaze is set and we'll head back over to the stove where by now our ham is cooked at 325 for 20 minutes and we will pull it out and we will begin the glazing process. We'll take our glaze and we will brush it all over. And this is only the first application so we don't have to go on really thick here. And fair warning, because this is such a thick, heavy glaze, you may tear off some of your little squares of fat from the surface don't worry, just kind of coax them back into place, and hopefully they'll just stick back right where they came from. So we'll go around and we'll glaze that ham, and then we'll put it back in the oven for another 20 minutes. And we're going to continue doing this every 20 minutes until our ham is ready. And I didn't say cooked. Ham's already cooked, so we're not going by that. We're going to simply continue roasting at 325, glazing every 20 minutes for about approximately 18 minutes per pound until we have an internal temperature of 130. And that's for the type of ham I'm using. Depending on which ham you're using, you may want to go a little higher, but as usual, I'll give all that extra info on the blog. But bottom line, every 20 minutes, you're gonna pull this out, you're gonna give it another glazing, and you're gonna continue doing that until you've reached your desired internal temp. Now, one extra little thing you can do here when you get down to what you think is the final glaze, I like to drip a little bit of that water from underneath on top, which is of course flavored with that star anise and clove. And that's going to kind of mingle with that glaze and kind of run in between the cracks and crevices. So I'm not exactly sure how much effect that has, but it feels right. But anyway, this was my last glaze. I popped it in for another 20 minutes or so. And at that point, my ham was at the perfect internal temp of 130. And not to mention, looked incredibly awesome. But wait, there's more. We still need to achieve that classic caramelized crispy coating. And if you want, you could turn your oven up to like 500 and do it in there. But I prefer this method, the old blowtorch. It's so much faster, so much better, plus it's way more fun. So I'm going to go over that surface with the torch. Not too much. We don't want to burn it. We just want that sugar to bubble. If your sugar bubbles, that means it's going to be crisp when it cools. So that's what I did here over the entire surface. And that really is the trick here to get that amazing magazine cover quality crust. And once we've brulee our glaze, we'll go ahead and transfer that onto our serving platter. And what's a special occasion better than a bed of kale? So I'm going to set my ham down on top of that. And then, of course, because this is for a special holiday dinner, I'm going to garnish with some little apples. I believe those are called lady apples. Or in French, I believe it's la petite, whatever the word for apple is. And you know, when it comes to food styling and plate presentations, I'm no Martha Stewart. I'm not even Rod Stewart. But it is the holiday, so you want to try to make it look nice. So we'll place those around. 
And that honey glazed ham is done and looking pretty spectacular if I do say so. And I know you're thinking, sure it looks great. I'm sure it tastes great. But did that glaze really caramelize to a crispy crackling finish? Well, check this out. I think I made my point. And then of course, let me slice into this for a little taste. And as you'll read about on the blog, I'm using an uncured country style ham, which looks paler and has a much lower water content than your typical supermarket ham. So if it looks a little different, that's the reason. Plus of course, my bad camera angles and lighting. But just because something doesn't look wet, doesn't mean it's dry. These style of hams, even though they have a much lower water content, still have a beautiful, tender, rich mouth feel and just incredible ham flavor. Of course, the drawback is they're way more expensive. But anyway, like I said, we'll talk about that on the blog. And that crispy glaze not only has an amazing texture, but that flavor really permeates that meat. Just incredible. So if your ham came with that disgusting little packet of goo that you're supposed to spread over when you bake it, throw that away. Throw it right in the garbage and do this instead. All right? So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. For peppercorn roast beef. That's right, we're gonna use the four horsemen of the peppercorn apocalypse for this very special holiday-inspired roast recipe. And speaking of revelations, we're gonna use a cut of beef, the tri-tip, that many of you have grilled during the summer, but maybe have never considered using in a recipe like this. Which is a shame because it works so perfectly. And first up, we're gonna prep the aforementioned peppercorns. We got your standard black. We're also gonna use some white peppercorns and some green peppercorns, which yes, are a little shriveled, but don't be concerned. I think that's normal. And then last but not least, the most festive of all peppercorns, the pink peppercorn. Check it out, that is pretty Christmassy. But anyway, I'm gonna take roughly equal parts of all four peppercorns, and we're gonna wanna give those a very coarse grind. I just threw them in one of these hand-turned pepper grinders, using the coarsest setting possible, and in just a short 45 minutes later, I had like three tablespoons. So yeah, that took a while, I should probably have used my spice grinder. But you know what? My wrists have been looking a little chunky, so it's good to get a workout in. And then we'll just set that aside while we prep our tri-tip roast. And there it is, the beef tri-tip. And you can see there at the top at the bigger end, it kind of forms a triangle, hence the name tri-tip roast. And these usually run about two and a half pounds, so very nice size for a dinner party. And mine came trimmed, and yours probably will too, but if it didn't, you want to trim it up pretty well. You want to take off any silver skin. Or if there's a thin layer of the white fat on there, you can leave that, that's fine. And then before we coat this bad boy, we're gonna go ahead and make a little bit of a garlic paste, which is simply a few cloves of garlic in the mortar with a pinch of salt, to which I added a little splash of olive oil, which was a total rookie mistake. Everybody knows you smash the garlic and the salt first, then you add the oil. It still works, it just takes like an annoying five minutes longer. But anyway, smash that into a paste. And then we're gonna go ahead and paint it on our tri-tip. And we're gonna do this to both sides. We're gonna paint the garlic on. Then we're gonna very thoroughly coat it with kosher salt. Don't be shy, that's a big hunk of meat. And then after you salt it, we're gonna go ahead and press on those peppercorns, and we're gonna cover the entire surface, or at least I am. And yes, it's gonna be very peppery, but it is called peppercorn beef after all. And once that side's covered, I'm gonna flip it over and do the exact same thing. Garlic paste, salt, peppercorns. And after both those flatter sides are covered, we're gonna go ahead and get any exposed area. So bottom line, when you're done, that entire tri-tip will be covered in garlic paste, generously salted, and pressed with those cracked peppercorns. So that's looking great right there. And then I'm gonna do one optional step, just so this recipe takes an entire extra day. I'm gonna throw this on a little rack so it sits up off the pan, and I'm gonna refrigerate that uncovered in my empty spare refrigerator in the garage that I'm sure everybody has. And I'm just gonna leave that to sit and kind of dry overnight. So it's not really dry aging, but kind of the same idea. It's gonna dry out a little bit, a little bit of water is gonna evaporate, it's gonna concentrate the flavors a little bit, and it's really gonna give that peppercorn crust a chance to adhere and permeate the meat with flavor. And then the next day I took it out, it looked like that. Pretty much looked the same. It gets a little darker, but don't be alarmed. And then before we pop that in the oven, I like to let it sit out on the table for one hour to warm up a little bit. Never a bad idea with a large piece of meat you're gonna roast. And then when we are ready to cook, we're gonna take a large skillet, big enough to fit that piece of meat. I'm gonna melt a couple tablespoons of butter, but we're not gonna sear this. We're gonna turn it off as soon as it melts. We're gonna toss our beef in. I'm gonna coat one side with the butter. I'm gonna turn it over, coat the other side. And then that's pretty much ready for the oven, except I am gonna give it a little more salt on top. Like I said, it's a big piece of meat and you're gonna have to try super hard to oversalt it. Unfortunately for home cooks, usually the opposite is the case and they undersalt and then they wonder why it's bland. So anyway, a little more salt. 
And then we're going to go ahead and pop that into a very well preheated 450 degree oven for 15 minutes. So we're going to start this off very hot. And then after 15 minutes, we're going to pull it out. We're going to turn our oven down to 200. We'll go ahead and flip over the roast. And then we'll pop that back in and we'll continue roasting at that low temperature for, I don't know, about 15, 20 minutes more. Or until it looks like this in the internal temperature, for me at least, is 130. That's what I'm recommending. You cook it how you want. You are the boss of your angle-shaped roast. But I went to 130. And at that point, we're going to transfer that onto a plate to rest. And I want you to tent that, but very loosely with foil. And just let it sit there resting for at least, at least 15 minutes, which is the perfect amount of time to finish the pan sauce. So we're not going to pour off any of that fat. You should have about a tablespoon or two in there. We're going to put that on medium heat. We're going to sprinkle in about a tablespoon of flour. We're going to cook that stirring with our whisk for about two minutes just to take the raw edge off that flour. And at that point, we're going to whisk in three cups of some very, very delicious beef or veal stock. Although, you know what? I used neither. I used oxtail stock, which I use as kind of a cheater demi-glaze, which I'm going to show you. But anyway, I went ahead and whisked in my oxtail stock. And then we're going to finish this with standard Food Wishes pan sauce procedure. Oh, you know how we do. We simply reduce this until it's the consistency we want. So turn your heat up to medium high, bring it up to a simmer. And while we're waiting for that to boil, we can go ahead and season it up a little bit. Now I'm thinking you're not gonna need any black pepper, but you may need some salt. And even though I totally didn't need it, I added some cayenne, because that's what I do. And then like I said, we're simply gonna reduce this down until it's the texture we want. And when it's getting close, I'm gonna add the final ingredients, which is just a small splash of balsamic vinegar, it's going to help with that beautiful, gorgeous brown color. It's also going to add a little bit of acidity and sweetness to the sauce. And by the way, don't let this fool you. I turned the heat down just so I could film it. You can just keep your simmering. And then last but not least, make sure you pour off any accumulated juices from your resting tri-tip plate. You cannot waste that. That would be a crime. All right, so I stirred in my juices and I kept cooking until it was perfect. And what did that look like for me? Here you go. Check it out. That is one super super sexy sauce look at that shine i could actually comb my hair in that pan if you know i had hair so anyway our sauce is set we're going to turn that off and it's time to carve the beef and we're going to start on that small end and cut across the grain now for appearances i probably should have started on the larger rarer end but that's okay even this meat that's almost well done at the end was still amazingly juicy and flavorful and of course as you cut towards that larger end the meat's going to get pinker and less cooked and by the way crazy people the juices aren't blood. Come on, read a book. But anyway, we're going to slice that up. We're going to plate that up. Warm plates, of course. And then we're going to spoon over that pan sauce. And that, my friends, was a spectacular roast beef. And I think you can see from this shot, that meat is so tender and so juicy. And so, what do the kids say these days? Amaze balls that you simply have to give it a try. The tri-tip, a very popular cut during the summer for grilling yet very seldom used in the winter for holiday roast. And I'm not sure why it works so beautifully. So I really do hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Easy baked beef brisket. That's right, not only is this apple and onion smothered beef brisket delicious and easy, it's also very fast. Although when it comes to brisket, very fast is a relative term, and this still takes like four hours. But above and beyond cooking this in like half the usual amount of time. The great thing about this method is it actually produces a brisket that is tender and still moist. Right, there's a lot of things I'll wait eight to 10 hours for, but dry beef is not one of them. So with that, let's go ahead and get started by seasoning up our brisket, which I'm gonna do very generously on both sides with a mixture of kosher salt, freshly ground black pepper, and a little cayenne. And by the way, the three pound piece of beef brisket you're looking at is actually only half of a whole brisket, with this half being the flatter, leaner side. And if you're buying brisket in your average supermarket, this is almost always the piece you're gonna get. But having said that, if you do use the other half or even a whole brisket, this technique will still work nicely. And generally these things are sold fairly well trimmed, but just in case yours wasn't, you'll wanna trim it down so there's no more than about a quarter inch layer of fat. But anyway, like I said, we will season that very generously, at which point we could go ahead and start the recipe. But what I highly recommend is popping this in the fridge overnight to let those seasonings really sink in. And to aid in that effort, what I like to do is roll up a couple pieces of foil to create sort of a makeshift rack for the plate. 
And what that'll do is raise that brisket up off the surface and allow some airflow underneath, as well as make a space for any moisture drawn out by the salt to drip down. So that is optional, but it only takes a second, and I think it does help. But either way, we'll go ahead and pop that in the fridge uncovered for about 8 to 12 hours. And then once that's set, we can move on to the only other thing we have to prep. And that would be our onion and apple mixture, which will eventually turn into our gravy. And we'll start that by sautéing some onions in butter over medium heat, along with a nice big pinch of salt. And of course, if you are making this for Passover, using that butter would not be kosher. So if that matters, you can go with some vegetable oil, or better yet, some schmaltz, also known as chicken fat. But anyway, what we're going to do is cook that stirring on medium heat until those onions soften up and turn translucent. And if you wanted, you could cook these until they were nicely browned and caramelized. But I'm not going to, because I'm adding apple juice to this, which is kind of sweet. So I'm going to keep these a little bit on the savory side. And like I said, just cook them until they turn soft and translucent. Of course, having said that, you go ahead and do them as long as you want. I mean, you are after all the Leonard Cohen of how far these onions should be going. And your sauce will have a little deeper color if you go longer. But as I mentioned, cooking them just to this point, I think will pair better with the apple juice. And by the way, in the business, this is referred to as sweating the onions. And then what we'll do once we think these have cooked long enough is go ahead and toss in some sliced garlic, as well as a little touch of freshly and finely chopped rosemary. And then we'll finish up with one cup of apple juice. And we'll go ahead and stir all that together, as well as raise our heat to high. Because before we use this, we want to reduce these liquids by about half. Oh, and please relax if you're not a great judge of what half of something is. Because if you didn't reduce this at all, it would still work. Or if you reduced all the liquid, it would still work. So just relax and let it boil for a couple minutes until you think maybe sort of half of the liquid is gone. At which point we will turn off the heat because that is now ready to use. And that's it. Once our onion mixture is set, we can go ahead and pull our beef out of the fridge. And because our meat was salted and uncovered, it's going to look a little darker, and the surface will look kind of leathery. But don't worry, it's supposed to look like that. And then what we'll do to get this ready for the oven is transfer half of our apple onion mixture into a baking dish. And as you can see, I do like to place a sheet pan underneath, which I think makes this easier to move around and will catch drips, not to mention possibly providing some heat diffusion. Although I'm not sure if that last one has any effect. But anyway, we'll go ahead and place our meat on top, fat side up. And then we'll transfer the rest of our mixture over the top. Oh, and if possible, try to choose a pan or baking dish that's just a little bigger than the brisket itself. Although, anything oven safe will work. And then once that's set, we'll go ahead and wrap that very tightly in foil. At which point it is ready to transfer into the center of a 325 degree oven, but only for an hour and a half. All right, this fast method for cooking brisket requires two temperatures. So we're going to start at 325. But after an hour and a half, we're going to turn it down to 250. And we'll continue at 250 for about 2 hours and 15 minutes. Or until our brisket looks like this. Well, not this. But like this. And if everything's gone according to plan, our beef should be fork tender. Which mine was. In fact, mine might have gone about 15 minutes longer than I needed. Which reminds me to tell you, it's probably not a bad idea to check yours after 2 hours at 250. But anyway, once our meat is tender... We'll go ahead and scrape those onions off the top into our cooking liquid. And we will carefully transfer that meat to a plate. And we'll use that foil we just pulled off to keep it warm. While we go ahead and finish our amazing apple onion gravy. And to do that, all we need to do is pour it into some kind of container. Because we are going to have a significant amount of rendered fat. And by pouring it into something like this, we can easily skim that off the top. At which point, if we want, it's ready to use in this form which is very delicious and would not look bad at all. But if we want to quickly and easily turn this into a gravy, all we need to do is blend it for a few seconds. And by the way, if you fill yours to the top like I did, be sure to pulse it on and off for just like a second at a time. Because if you turn it on and leave it on, this is what's going to happen. So that was unfortunate. But these things will happen. And I simply cleaned it up and kept blending, as if nothing had even happened. And by simply blending those cooking liquids, we've produced quite a gorgeous sauce that tastes even better than it looks. And of course, you'll give it a taste for seasoning, but I bet it's very close. And that's it. Once our apple and onion gravy is ready, we can go ahead and slice our meat, which you always want to do across the grain, which for me are going this way. So I'll have to slice across that way. But I'm going to turn this around because I have my eye 
on this beautiful succulent-looking end, and I will slice them off so I can go in for a taste. And even though we used a relatively short cooking time, this meat was beautifully tender, and more importantly, still very moist. All right, if you really know what you're doing, those low and slow methods can work out and produce something similar to this, but it can be a little trickier. Plus, if it's about the same, why are we waiting six extra hours? That is a good question. Another good question is why am I eating this on a cutting board and not next to a mashed potato pancake and carrot salad with my meat being sauced with that amazing apple and onion gravy that we may want to garnish with some finely snipped chives. And yes, that is kind of a big pile of beef. But one taste, and you'll understand why I needed that much. And above and beyond the moist tender meat this method produces, that subtle earthy sweetness from our onion and apple mixture has really permeated that brisket and somehow makes things taste even beefier. And in case you're wondering, as delicious as that gravy is on the beef, it also worked amazingly well on my mashed potato pancake, which I'm pretty sure we have a video for. But if we don't, I will take care of that at some point. In fact, as great as the beef and sauce was, I have to admit to being sort of distracted by that pancake. Although to balance things, I was not at all distracted by the carrot salad. But anyway, that's it. What I'm calling easy baked beef brisket, even though it's technically braised. But that aside, this method is much faster and produces results just as good, if not better, than the classic low and slow method. Plus, once we're done cooking, we're able to produce one of the easiest and most delicious gravies ever. So whether you plan on leaving out the butter and making this for Passover, or maybe you plan on making this for that friend of yours who's very proud of their beef brisket, which takes like 12 hours, and you've never had the heart to tell them it's a little bit dry, or you're just in the mood for moist, tender beef brisket, but don't want to spend all day waiting for it to cook. Either way, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Moroccan Spiced Pork Roast. That's right, serving a gorgeous, fancy-looking holiday roast does not have to be complicated, time-consuming, or expensive. And hopefully this incredibly delicious and very easy Moroccan Spiced Pork Loin will prove exactly that. Okay, this thing is fast, easy, and, believe it or not, affordable. But despite all that, when you bring this to the table, it looks like a million dollars. And your guests will be thinking, thank God we're not having prime rib or beef wellington. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. And the first thing we're going to need to do is butterfly a pork loin roast, which usually these days comes pretty much fully trimmed. And please note, one edge is going to be a little bigger and a little rounder, whereas the opposite edge will be a little thinner and a little more ragged. And it's that side where we want to start our cut. And what we'll do using a sharp, thin knife is slice right into the center, keeping our blade parallel to the cutting board. And we want to slice in, but not all the way through. Okay, we want to stop about an inch from the other side, so we can open this like a book. And this is not a game of speed, so take your time. And then once we're able to open that up, we can use some smaller cuts to do a little fine-tuning. So this hopefully lays out nice and flat. And then what we'll do once that's been accomplished is season this very generously with five teaspoons of kosher salt, right inside and out. And by the way, as usual, if you're using fine salt, you'll only need about half this amount. Oh, and I should mention if you're scared or don't have a thin, sharp knife and you don't think you can cut it this way, you can actually still do this recipe just seasoning on the outside. I mean, you are after all the crazy town of whether this butterflying goes down, but being able to season this inside and out is a huge advantage. But anyway, we'll go ahead and season that very generously inside and out, at which point we'll transfer that onto a plate and believe it or not, let it sit out at room temp for 30 to 45 minutes which I'm sure is gonna make a few of you nervous, but that's fine. While we don't wanna be scared, being a little bit nervous can be fun. And please believe me when I tell you nothing bad's gonna happen here. Having said that, if you wanna do this in the fridge for two or three hours, that's fine too. And then what we'll do while we're giving our pork what is basically a quick dry brine, is go ahead and whip up our Moroccan spice paste, which will contain some ground cumin, some coriander, some ground ginger, some freshly ground black pepper, some smoked paprika, some cayenne, of course, some cinnamon, some ground cloves, and last but not least, some allspice. And then what we'll do to turn this into a paste is squeeze in about three tablespoons of honey, 
And then we can take a spoon and give this a mix. And as you start mixing this, it might look a little too thick and dry. But don't worry, just keep stirring. And in about a minute, you should end up with something that looks like this. And if it doesn't, just add another squeeze of honey. And then once that's set, we'll go back to our butterfly pork, which to recap has been sitting out for 30 to 45 minutes. And we'll go ahead and open that up. And we'll proceed to spread over about half our spice mixture. Which, by the way, is going to be a lot easier to do if you pat the meat dry. Right, that salting is going to create a bit of moisture, which is going to make this harder to spread on. So probably not a bad idea here to pat that dry with a paper towel. Although, as you can see, once I got started, it wasn't too bad. And like I said, we'll spread about half that inside, and then the rest on the exterior bottom and top. And by top, I mean the fattier side if you have one. Okay, this was fairly well trimmed, but if you do have one side that has a little more fat than the other, have that side up. And that's it. Once our pork's been Moroccan spiced, we'll go ahead and take some pieces of kitchen twine and tie this up every few inches. And a big tip here, when you start, make sure you twist that through three or four times before you cinch it up. And that will create some friction and keep that tie cinched until you finish the knot. And then once completed, I like to trim off the excess. And we will go ahead and do that three or four times, every about inch and a half or so. And besides holding our pork together and helping it roast a little more evenly, once this is cooked and those are removed, the marks it leaves are going to help give this that classic holiday roast look. And then once that's bound, we'll go ahead and transfer that into some kind of baking dish or roasting pan, into which we've drizzled a couple tablespoons of olive oil. And then if we're including them, which you should, we will go ahead and surround this with whatever vegetables we're going to serve it with, which in my case are some little potatoes, some chunks of carrot, some red onions, and a couple nice long green Anaheim chilies that I split in half. And we'll go ahead and arrange those around our meat. And yes, in case you're wondering, I did toss those with some olive oil and salt first. And that's it. Once our baking dish has been potatoed and vegetabled, I'm going to go ahead and clean off any excess oil or drippings, mostly so I don't drop this on the way to the stove. And once that's been wiped, this is now ready to transfer into the center of a 350 degree oven for about an hour and 15 minutes, or until the internal temp in the thickest part reads 140 to 145. And once it's reached that point, it should look very similar to this, which looks pretty good, but hang on, it gets much, much better. Because what we'll do at this point is grab some tongs, and we'll give that meat a turn or two in those beautiful pan drippings, at which point we will transfer that onto a plate Cover it loosely with foil, and we will let it sit and rest like that for 15 minutes before we slice it. And what I usually like to do while I'm waiting for that is go ahead and toss our potatoes and veggies in those drippings, which by the way just smell insanely delicious. And then what I'll do once those are all nicely coated is crank my oven up to like 425 and toss those back in for a little extra roasting while our meat's resting. And of course, if you think they're already perfect, don't bother. But generally, this kind of stuff always could use a little extra caramelization. So I did pop those back in for about 10 minutes. And that's it. Once we're ready to serve, we'll go ahead and remove our strings. And of course, any of those accumulated juices will get added back into our pan drippings. And then once unstrung, we'll go ahead and platter our pork. And we will surround that with our roast vegetables. And of course, we're also going to shine up the top with a few spoons of our drippings to create what I think is just an absolutely gorgeous presentation. And as I mentioned earlier, those marks the strings left really, I think, help give this that classic holiday roast look. Okay, just the way it creates those subtle shadows, to me, really makes this look more appealing and provocative, which is why in the business we refer to that as culinary cleavage. But anyway, we'll go ahead and spoon over some of those drippings. And that's it, our Moroccan spice pork roast is ready to slice and serve. And if you followed the instructions and let it sit out salted at room temp as directed, and also pull this out when it was between 140 and 145 internal temp, you're going to be enjoying some of the juiciest, most flavorful pork you've ever had. And keep in mind, this was an outside slice, and it was still practically dripping with moisture. And as awesome as the texture was, the flavor on this thing is equally fantastic. Okay, all those beautifully aromatic and warming spices really work so well with a pork roast. Which is why, by the way, a lot of these same spices are used when we cure and glaze hams. So I really can't even explain how much I was enjoying these slices. I mean, we hit the trifecta here of looks great, feels great, tastes great. And I would have been very happy just continuing to slice and eat this off the platter. But I decided to stop and plate up a few slices, which of course we're always going to want to top with some of those amazingly flavorful pan drippings. Plus, if you want, and I almost always do, 
I like to garnish this also with a little bit of garlic and mint yogurt sauce, which not surprisingly you make by adding mint and garlic to yogurt. And as insanely great as this is with just the drippings, a little bit of that cool garlicky herbaceous yogurt really elevates this pork even further. Oh, and I should mention, this recipe is adapted from a method that usually uses leg of lamb, which would also be absolutely perfect used here. But whether you end up using pork or lamb, this really will be tremendous. It proves you don't have to spend a lot of time, effort, and money to serve an incredibly delicious and super fancy looking holiday or special occasion roast. Which is why I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Eggnog. That's right, have you ever been eating a bowl of custard and thought to yourself, this is good, but I wish I had more nutmeg, and also I'd like to be able to drink it. Well, good news. This iconic Christmas beverage might be just the thing. And I know I did do some recent anti-eggnog tweets, but I was mostly down on the store-bought kind that tends to be way too thick and too sweet, and not to mention doesn't contain any whiskey. So I thought I'd go ahead and show you how to make the real stuff, which is completely different than the stuff in the carton. It's actually quite delicious, and this is how you make it. So the first thing we're going to need here is a whole bunch of freshly grated nutmeg. And usually because we're just using a pinch, we'll just grate a little bit into the sauce, or whatever we're using it in, and that's it. But in this case, because we need so much more, and we have to measure out like three quarters of a teaspoon, that's going to be too hard to determine just by grating it in. So that's why we're going to simply grate it onto a plate, and that way we're going to be able to get a little more accurate of a measurement. So we'll go ahead and we'll grate our nutmeg, and set that aside until we need it. At which point we can move on to operation separate four eggs. So for our nog, we're going to need four egg whites and four egg yolks. And the last time we did this, I used the through the hand method. But several viewers pointed out that the oils on your hands could affect the whipping of the egg whites. Which I guess is technically true, although that's never happened to me. No matter what method I use, the egg whites seem to work fine. But anyway, I did use the shell to shell method nonetheless. And one quick thing I wanted to mention, it's always okay to get a little egg white in your egg yolk. But you never want any yolk in your white, because that fat's going to prevent them from whipping up, okay? But anyway, we're going to separate four eggs, and then start doing stuff to them. And the first thing we're going to do is add some sugar to the yolks, and take a whisk and mix that for about a minute, or until the mixture kind of lightens up and gets a little creamy, and looks like this. At which point we can go ahead and add our dairy, in two forms. We're going to do a couple cups of milk, as well as a cup of heavy cream. And we'll go ahead and give that a stir. And then what we'll do is we'll take this mixture over to the stove and place that down on medium heat and cook it whisking very often until it reaches a temperature of between 170 and 180 degrees, which to a bare fingertip is gonna feel very hot and almost too hot to touch. So that is how some people tell, but that is obviously very unscientific. So my preferred method of course is to use a thermometer, thereby taking all the guesswork out of it. And sometimes when we're cooking similar mixtures, we can kind of watch to see when it thickens up as an indicator for when it's done. But because we only have four egg yolks here, and that's a lot of liquid, the viscosity is really not going to change too much here, okay? So we really do want to check with the thermometer. So like I said, we're going to keep that on medium heat, stirring quite often, until we hit our target temperature, which I said is about 170, 180, at which point we can quickly and carefully remove that from the heat. And while the mixture is still piping hot, we can stir in our freshly grated nutmeg. And then once that's set, we can add another key ingredient, which some crazy people consider optional, but I don't, and that would be the whiskey. So I'm gonna add two splashes of some nice bourbon. Some people do go with the rum, but I prefer the whiskey. But of course, that's up to you. You are Kermit the Frog of your Christmas eggnog. And speaking of being green, don't drink too much of this. An eggnog hangover is not recommended. So we'll go ahead and we'll stir in a little bit of booze, at which point we need to cool this down and refrigerate it until very, very cold. And to speed up that process, I like to cool mine in an ice water bath. Except I don't waste any ice. We need to save that for the cocktails. So if you use a nice big bowl and lots of cold fresh water, just give it a stir once in a while and that's gonna cool down very quickly, you'll see. And by the way, I wanted to mention, a lot of the cool kids are doing non-cooked versions of eggnog. And there's actually no heat involved. Everything's done by whisking and emulsifying the ingredients together. But while you can get a similar texture, I really think the cooked version tastes better. But as usual with these kind of theories, there's no way to prove them. And then what we're gonna do when our mixture cools down to room temp is transfer this into some kind of container. And I like to use this glass pitcher, which is not only gonna allow me to chill this, but there's also gonna be enough room in here to mix in my egg whites and serve right from this same container. 
So we'll transfer in our now cooled custard mixture, and we will pop that in the fridge for a couple hours or until thoroughly chilled. At which point we can move into final production, which starts with our meringue. So we will take our four reserved egg whites and start to beat those with a whisk just until we get some very, very soft peaks forming. Something similar to what you see right here. And once it reaches this stage, what we'll do is we'll sprinkle in one tablespoon of sugar and continue whisking until we have stiffer peaks. Okay, we don't want to go too far, but we do want to whip it until it's at least this stage so that those egg whites will hold a peak like that. Right, sometimes I refer to this as the shaving cream stage because that's pretty much what it looks like, or at least back in the day when there was shaving cream. But anyway, once our egg whites are whipped up, we can go ahead and stir them into our now very, very ice cold custard base. Just whisk it right in. Don't worry about anything like folding. We're not doing a souffle here. Just mix it all together. And believe it or not, our eggnog is done. And yes, if your custard base was super ice cold, you could enjoy this now. But really, I think it's best if you put it back in the fridge and chill it thoroughly again. And while a lot of that frothiness will dissipate as it sits and chills in the fridge, I think the taste and texture of this is better if you do chill it thoroughly again. But either way, when you're ready to serve, we will transfer that into some appropriate cup or mug. And what's going to happen as you pour that in? This thin but gorgeous layer of meringue is going to form on the top, which should give us that classic eggnog look. Speaking of which, it is mandatory. We will finish this with a little extra grating of fresh nutmeg, and our eggnog is officially ready to serve. And by the way, I know that looks like a nice leather placemat, but it's not. It's not real leather. It's actually nagahide. Oh yeah, some of these just write themselves. But anyway, that's it, your classic homemade Christmas eggnog. If you've never had the real stuff, imagine a luxuriously textured bourbon spiked custard being sipped through a thin layer of nutmeg scented meringue. I know, that does sound delicious, and it is. And I really should have shown this earlier before I poured the first one, but you must whisk this every time you pour. And that goes for re-pours like this, as well as whisking it very thoroughly before you pour that first one. And that way you're always incorporating those whipped egg whites back into the mixture, which really does give it that beautiful, smooth, but not too thick texture, okay? And hey, if you're going to top it off, you might as well really top it off. And yes, that will be the most popular question after this is posted. Do I have to put the booze? Can you do it without the bourbon? Well, of course you can, but you shouldn't. Not only does that bourbon add an important flavor element, but at the Christmas party, it's going to make everybody's story seem a little more interesting. So there is that to consider. But anyway, that's it. How to make homemade eggnog. Whether you're going to make it for the Christmas party or just the next time you feel like drinking dessert, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Hot buttered rum. That's right, I am trying to do a voiceover after drinking two hot buttered rums. Or as people that have had three of them call them, hot ruttered bums. But anyway, I'm sure I'll be fine. At least I feel fine. Like really fine. And while eggnog gets a lot more press, for me, hot buttered rum is the ultimate festive holiday drink. All right, so rich, so delicious, so satisfying, and super easy to make. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with what they call the hot butter rum batter, which is not gonna begin with hot butter, but rather nice and soft room temperature butter, to which we will add one half cup of severely packed dark brown sugar, plus a little touch of real pure vanilla extract, followed by an array of all our favorite holiday spices, which of course means cinnamon, as well as some ground ginger. Then we'll also want some freshly and finely grated nutmeg. And when I say finely grated, I mean don't press down too hard on the grater. Okay, we don't want big chunks. We're also gonna put in just a little touch of cardamom, as well as an equally small pinch of ground cloves. And then last but not least, assuming we're using unsalted butter, which we are, and ideally a really high quality one, we'll also need a small pinch of salt. And that's it, we'll go ahead and take a spatula and we'll mix, mash, and smear this into a very smooth paste. And by the way, since all this is going to get melted by boiling water, achieving a smooth texture is not a big deal. But making sure all those spices are incorporated evenly is. So please take your time and give this a very thorough and thoughtful spatulation. And that's it. Once our batter's mixed, it's ready to use. And if we're going to use it right away in this soft form, which I am, we'll go ahead and take a spoon and scoop out about two tablespoons of this stuff. Although, like everything else in this drink, that's going to be to taste. But I do think we want a nice generous spoon like this. And we'll go ahead and transfer that into some kind of heat-proof, festive holiday mug. Preferably one with a poinsettia design. But in a pinch, holly will work. And then to our hot butter rum batter, we'll go ahead and add a little bit of heavy cream. Which is optional, but 
but I think mandatory. And then of course we're going to need to add some rum, which for me is going to be three tablespoons of dark rum. And obviously if you'd prefer to use white rum, go ahead. That's up to you. I mean, you are after all the Peter Gunn of your hot buttered rum. But anyway, if you're not sure, go ahead and investigate and try a few different kinds and see which one you like. But put me down as a dark rum guy. And that's it. Once that's set, we'll go ahead and fill this about halfway up with boiling water. And we'll give it a stir with our spoon until that batter is completely dissolved. At which point we'll top it off with the rest for a total boiling water amount of about three quarters of a cup to one cup. Again, depending on your taste. And that's it. We'll give it one final stir before garnishing with either a sprinkle of cinnamon or a little extra grating of nutmeg, which is what I prefer. And again, use a very light touch. We don't want chunks. And that's it. Our hot buttered rum is ready to enjoy. Except I didn't. I took like 100 pictures. And if you end up doing that, as soon as you finish your Instagram, you'll probably want to give it one more stir before you start sipping. Speaking of which, let me go ahead and grab this and start doing exactly that. So cheers to you. And that, my friends, is probably my favorite hot drink of all time, holiday or otherwise. Okay, it is nice and rich, but not too rich. As well as, this version I like is not too sweet. Alright, some formulas call for a ridiculous amount of sugar, but rum already has a nice sweet flavor. So I don't think we need a ton in the batter. And I think the real genius of this drink is the incredible texture and mouthfeel you get as you sip that hot, sweet, spicy mixture through that layer of butter on the top. And above and beyond that, it also acts as a layer of insulation and actually helps keep the drink warm. So we got that going for us, which is nice. And please be careful, it does not taste like there's an ounce and a half of hard liquor in here. But there is. But anyway, that's one hot buttered rum down. And that's how we do them if we're using the batter fresh. But if you make the batter ahead of time, which is a great idea, what we'll do is transfer it onto a piece of plastic wrap. And then we'll sort of shape it into a tube. If possible, something close to like a stick of butter size. And then once we have that smoothed out to a nice uniform shape, what we'll do is simply transfer that into the fridge or freezer until we're ready to use it. At which point we'll pull it out and slice off portions like this. And again, the exact amount's gonna be up to you. Okay, I'd say between one and a half and two tablespoons is just about perfect. But anyway, you decide. And that's it, we'll take a slice of that and pop it in our mug and then repeat all the earlier steps. Oh, and fun fact, rum is America's oldest liquor. And this drink actually dates back to colonial times. And what you're gonna do with that info, I have no idea. But anyway, I just thought you should know. Oh, and regarding the cream, some recipes actually call for using melted vanilla ice cream, which I think is kind of crazy, because why are we wasting good ice cream? Since melted ice cream is really nothing more than sweet and cream with a little bit of vanilla in it. Plus, it might have artificial ingredients and stabilizers. So to me, it just makes a lot more sense to go with the cream. But anyway, I went ahead and mixed this one up exactly like the first, except in addition to the nutmeg garnish, I also decided to garnish with this amazing log and pine cones that Michelle found along with the obligatory holiday poinsettia plant. And no, I don't usually do a lot of food styling, and basically this is why. Oh, and the reason I'm only showing you part of the plant is because we're still working on the kitchen, and I'm working on some open shelving, which is all taped up, and I didn't think it looked good, as you can see from this quick peek. But anyway, I tried. And yes, once everything's fixed up, we're gonna do a nice reveal. But anyway, that's it. How I like to do hot buttered rum. We're officially calling it a festive holiday drink, but really, if we're being honest, this is a lot closer to a liquid dessert. And as much as I enjoyed that first one, for whatever reason, the second one seemed even more pleasurable. But no matter how many you drink, responsibly, of course, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Chocolate Yule Log. That's right, I don't think I'm going out on a limb when I say many home cooks would not attempt something like this because they assume it involves many components, lots of steps, and super advanced culinary skills to make. Well, I'm very happy to tell you that only two out of those three things are true because while this does require a little bit of time and effort, the techniques involved in making this Bush de Noel are actually quite simple, especially if you have a video that shows you how to do them. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with our filling. And by filling, I mean very simple buttercream frosting. And for that, we're gonna combine some powdered sugar with a little bit of butter, as well as a touch of cocoa powder, which is high quality and unsweetened, by the way. Then we'll also add a pinch of salt, 
as well as a splash of coffee liqueur and or extract. And what we'll do is take that over to our mixer and whip it up until it's very light and fluffy. And if your butter's nice and soft, this is going to happen very quickly and easily. But if it's still kind of firm and cold like mine, it's not. It's going to stick in the middle of the whisk and really do nothing. And you'll have to stop and work it with your spatula and do that a few times until it starts to soften up, which I won't make you watch. But either way, we're going to whip that on high speed until, like I said, it's very, very light and fluffy. And hopefully it looks a little something like this. And while we could certainly use this as is, I'm going to go ahead and transfer this into a bowl and add one more ingredient, a nice big spoon of mascarpone cheese, which is a wonderfully rich Italian style cream cheese. And we'll go ahead and use our spatula to mix that in. And that's going to add a really nice little bit of tanginess in the background, as well as sort of lighten this up a little. And by the way, you know your frosting is pretty decadent when you're lightening it up with mascarpone. But anyway, we'll go ahead and stir that in and then simply set that aside until we need it. At which point we'll move on to one more thing we need to do ahead of time. And that would be to line a baking sheet with some parchment paper and brush it generously with melted butter. And I didn't show it, but a little tip, put a little butter on the pan before you put the paper down, which will sort of hold it in place while you brush it. And then once our pan is prepped, we can move on to this very simple chocolate sponge cake recipe, which we will start by combining our dry ingredients, which includes cocoa powder, some salt, and just a little bit of all-purpose flour. And what we'll do is go ahead and take a whisk and give that a good mix, even though technically we really should sift this. Okay, and the reason is sometimes you get little clumps or lumps of cocoa that you really want to have broken up before you add it to the wet stuff. And while whisking this together for a minute generally does break those up, I would say sifting does do a better job. But either way, once that's been accomplished, we can move on to our wet ingredients, which are exactly five large eggs that are room temperature. Very important, you do not use cold eggs for this. And then to the eggs, we'll add a little touch of sugar. And what we're going to do here is whip these on high speed for a few minutes until they turn very, very pale, very thick, and very fluffy. Which is why, if possible, you really do want to use an electric mixer for this. I mean, sure, you can do it by hand, but it's going to take a long time and a lot of effort. Although the good news is you'll probably burn more calories than the average serving of cake. But either way, we're going to whip those eggs and sugar until they get really thick and fluffy and look exactly like this. All right, you see that? Do not stop before it looks like this. And then what we'll do at this point is add our dry ingredients in two additions. Okay, we'll transfer in about half. In this first addition, we're just going to mix for a few seconds. All right, not on high speed. On one of your lower settings, just until it starts to mix in. Oh, and if you're going to forget to put in your vanilla extract, this would be the point you would forget to do that. So yes, I should have added that here, and I'll mention that in the blog post. But anyway, as I was saying, we're going to mix that first half in for a few seconds. And even though it's not totally mixed in, we're going to stop and add the rest. And then we'll start that on low for a few seconds before turning it up to a higher speed for a few more seconds. At which point we're going to stop, and it's still not all mixed in. But again, that's not a problem, because we're going to finish this by hand. Okay, just pull off that whisk and give that a few stirs manually, and then give it a check. And it was close, but I decided to give it a few more stirs. And this way we can make sure we're incorporating everything around the edges and along the bottom without knocking out too much of that foaminess, which could possibly happen if we mix this all the way with the machine. And then once that's set, we'll go ahead and transfer that onto our baking sheet. And we'll use a spatula to spread that out as even as we can. And please note, I'm not going all the way out to the edges. And you can if you want, it's not really a problem. But I actually prefer to leave a little space on either end. And while those edges will be a little thinner once it bakes, I think that works out in our favor later on. But bottom line, we'll go ahead and transfer our batter on and spread it out, at which point we have to give this thing the old tappa tappa. Because while we do want all the millions and millions of little bubbles in there, we want to knock out the few hundred big bubbles. So we'll go ahead and bang that on the table a few times before we transfer it into the center of a 400 degree oven for just eight to 10 minutes, or until it looks like what you're gonna see in a few seconds. And while that's baking, we're gonna have just enough time to take a clean kitchen towel and cover it with a nice dusting of powdered sugar. And you don't have to do the whole thing, just an area slightly bigger than a sheet pan. And you're gonna see why in just a minute. And we'll go ahead and pull out our cake, which after about eight to 10 minutes should look like this. And what we'll wanna do is let this cool down for a couple minutes while we do a few things. One would be to go around with a knife, making sure it's not stuck to the pan. And if it is, just cut it loose. And the other would be to dust the top of this with a little bit of powdered sugar. 
And what the powdered sugar is doing on the cake and the towel is preventing this very sticky sponge from sticking. And by the way, you can if you want use cocoa, but that's more expensive than powdered sugar. So I'm going with this. And then once that's set, we'll go ahead and give this one last check with a spatula to make sure it's not sticking anywhere. Because the next step is to flop this over onto our towel, which is my preferred method. Right, some people like to cover it with a towel and then flip it over. But as long as you have this lined up and you do it quick, it's going to be fine. And then we'll remove the pan and carefully peel off our parchment paper. And hopefully none of it sticks. Even though almost always a little bit does. But that's fine because you get to scrape that off with your fingernail and eat it. And get a little sneak preview. And then before we roll this up in our towel, we want to give it one more dusting of powdered sugar. Because I can't stress enough how much this stuff loves to stick to anything. Plastic, metal, wood, even a towel. So we'll go ahead and dust that again. And then very carefully, very gently roll this up. And because this is such a delicate sponge, we don't want to be pressing down as we do this. Okay, so use a very light touch. And we'll go ahead and roll that all the way. And then all we're going to do is let this cool down rolled up like this for 15 minutes. And by doing this, the sponge is going to have the memory of this roll so that when we unroll it and spread our filling on, we can roll it back up without it cracking. So this is a very key step. And as you can see, some of the sugar actually stuck to the towel, but none of the cake did. So mission accomplished. And at this point, we can go ahead and transfer on our filling and spread it out evenly. And to make that a little easier, what we like to do is dollop our filling here and there so that it's equally distributed before we start spreading it around. Okay, versus dumping it all in one spot and then trying to spread it all out evenly. And by the way, I thought I was being really judicious with the buttercream here. But as it turned out, I put on a lot more than I realized, as you'll see in the final shots. Which is great if you're one of these frosting people. But I'm more of a cake guy. Anyway, the point is you spread on as much as you want. I mean, you are, after all, the me of this edible tree. So we will leave this cake to frosting ratio up to you. And then once we have that all spread out, we can go ahead and carefully start to roll this up. And the first few inches are the hardest. And if you need to use the towel to kind of help you along, go ahead. But once you get it started, you should be fine. And because our sponge has that quote unquote memory of being rolled, you shouldn't really have a problem with it cracking. And just like the first time we rolled it, don't press down too hard. Okay, use a nice light touch. And once we're happy with how that's rolled and shaped, we'll go ahead and dust the top with a little more sugar. Because why not? And then once that's dusted, we'll go ahead and wrap it in plastic. And please accept my apologies for speeding this up, which I hate to do. But I didn't have enough interesting things to say to fill up the time. But anyway, we're going to go ahead and wrap that in plastic. And I'm doing two layers, even though I'm only showing one. And once wrapped, we're going to transfer that into the fridge for a few hours or until it's completely chilled before we apply our bark. So we'll go ahead and pop that in the fridge. And while it's in there, I'm going to go ahead and make my chocolate ganache, which is nothing more than dark chocolate chips with hot boiling cream poured over it. And we'll let that sit like that for about a minute before stirring it together. And as usual with chocolate ganache, it looks terrible. But then you keep stirring, and eventually it looks awesome. And as that cools, it's going to thicken up. As you can see right here with a little bit I had left over from a different batch. And to me, that makes one of the great chocolate frostings of all time. And as you're about to see, makes a very beautiful bark. And then, assuming our chocolate yule log is completely chilled, we'll go ahead and pull that out and unwrap it. And we'll cut a little piece off the end. Officially to kind of clean it up. But unofficially because I wanted to taste it. And it was amazing. And by the way, I didn't like what that serrated edge was doing. So I switched to a straight edge knife. And what we want to do is make an angled cut about three inches or so from the end. Because what's going to happen once we transfer the main log to a parchment lined sheet pan is that we're going to apply a little bit of buttercream to that cut piece and sort of stick or press that onto the side to make it look like there's another branch coming off our log. And while this step's optional, I think it really does make for a much more impressive presentation. And then once that was set, I took the rest of my leftover ganache and used that to cover where that branch attached. And as far as working with the ganache, you can let it get really stiff like this, and as long as it's still spreadable, it's fine. But as you can see, as I continue covering this with the fresh ganache, I find this looser, runnier stuff a little easier to work with. All right, as long as it's not too runny. Okay, we don't want this running all over our pan. 
But either way, we're going to go ahead and apply a nice layer of our ganache over the entire log, all right, all the way down to the bottom. But of course, we will leave the front and side uncovered so we can see our beautiful swirl. And people can see that our log is roughly five to six years old. And just by spreading the ganache over like this, you're going to get a fairly bark-like appearance. But for our final bark details, what we want to do is pop this in the fridge for about 15 or 20 minutes until that stuff firms up a little bit. And then using the tip of the knife, we can really give this thing the texture of actual bark. Okay, just drag that tip through all over. And since real bark is kind of rough and irregular, there's really no way to screw this up. But personally, I think the rougher and more irregular, the better. And yes, this is exactly as fun as it looks, which is super fun. And then once we have those final details done, what we have to do again is chill this thoroughly before serving. So we'll pop that back into the fridge until we're ready to serve, at which point we'll transfer that onto some kind of attractive serving platter or a gorgeous piece of marble and proceed to dust the top a little bit of cocoa as well as a little powdered sugar to make it look even more like an old log that has a little bit of frost. And while your guests will be very, very impressed if you serve it just like this, if you wanted to, you could also add some gingerbread dirt as well as some meringue mushrooms which are super easy to make. And maybe I'll show you how to do those. And for a final touch, maybe we'll add a few rosemary sprigs here and there to complete the scene. And that's it, our chocolate Yule log is done. And it totally looks like we knew what we were doing. I mean, if this doesn't impress your friends and family, I'm sorry, but your friends and family are too hard to impress. But just looking amazing is not enough. This also should taste incredible. So I went ahead and cut a slice to try it out. And I play that up next to some meringue mushrooms, which are never not adorable. And despite it having a little too much buttercream for my taste, it really was fantastic. All right, that almost flourless chocolate sponge is just sweet enough and still very moist and paired perfectly with that very simple mocha buttercream. So above and beyond his show-stopping appearance, I really did enjoy the taste and texture of this as well. Oh, and I should mention, before this gets rolled up, you can actually soak the sponge with a little bit of liqueur or liquor, just like I'm doing here with some Kahlua. So if you did want to adult this up, you can brush or drizzle that onto the sponge itself, or just add some on when you slice it and serve it like this. So just a little bonus tip for how to help achieve those rosy Santa Claus-like cheeks. But anyway, I'll finish the rest of this slice off later. Right now I have to take a little mushroom break. Make that a mushrooms break. But anyway, that's it. My method for making the classic holiday bush de Noel. Like I said in the intro, not really that hard to make. Although it does take a fair amount of time and effort. But when you're done, it looks like it takes a lot of time and effort. Which really is the point of a special holiday dessert. So I really do hope you give this a try soon. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. The Queen's Christmas Pudding. That's right, I'm not sure when or even if I'll be asked to make Christmas pudding for the queen, but if that happens, this is the one I'm gonna make her, since it really is spectacular. Oh, and if you're wondering why they call this a pudding and not a cake, well, that's because our British friends call every dessert a pudding, except pudding, which they call custard. But in any event, let's go ahead and get started by chopping up some dried fruit, which for me will include some pitted medjool dates, as well as some Turkish apricots, and a little tip here, to help prevent the fruit from sticking to the knife, if we take a little bit of vegetable oil on our finger and rub it on both sides of the knife like this, and be careful, don't cut yourself. That's going to help our blade from getting all gummed up. All right, it's still going to stick a little bit, but not quite as much. And yes, you can use a food processor if you want. But for me, the texture is not going to be as good, because while some of the pieces will be chopped nicely, a lot of them will get pureed into a sticky paste, which is not really what I want or I assume the queen wants. But either way, we'll go ahead and chop that up fairly small until we have something that looks like this, at which point we'll go ahead and transfer that into a nice big mixing bowl and proceed to add the rest of our dried fruit, which for me will include some currants, which are basically like little tiny raisins. And then I'm also gonna add some actual raisins, which are basically just like extra large currants. And then I'm also gonna do a whole bunch of dried cranberries, which I'm not a huge fan of normally, but that tartness is very important in this. And then we'll definitely also do some candied ginger, which I chopped up nice and small. 
And that's it. Once our bowl's been fully fruited, we'll go ahead and pour in two or three tablespoons of your favorite whiskey. Okay, I'm using a nice bourbon here, but even a bad bourbon would be good. And then what we'll do is give that a quick mix. And then we'll let it sit for a few minutes while we go ahead and zest and juice one large orange or a clementine or a couple tangerines. And we'll go ahead and add that zest and juice and stir that in as well. And then in a lot of Christmas pudding recipes, they want us to wrap this up and let it sit like overnight so that fruit absorbs the liquor and moisture from the orange. But that is not how I pudding. And I'll explain why later. But what we are going to do is pour in a whole bunch of melted butter and then we'll take our spatula and give this a stir until everything's evenly coated. And yes, in the classic recipe, the fat used here would be suet, but I was fresh out and I assume you don't have any sitting around. But that's fine, as you'll see, the butter works beautifully. And what we'll do once that's been mixed in is stop and add one beaten egg, a splash of heavy cream, as well as some buttermilk. And then we'll take our spatula and give all this a stir. And if you can't find buttermilk, no problem. You can just use regular milk, but I do like that little bit of extra tanginess the buttermilk gives you. So if you do use milk, maybe squeeze in half a lemon to compensate. But anyway, once that's mixed up, we'll go ahead and add the rest of our ingredients, which would be a little bit of salt, some chopped pecans, or the festive nut of your choice, some dry breadcrumbs, and then last but not least, we will add some all-purpose flour. And that's it. We'll simply take a spatula and give this a mix until we formed a very thick, very sticky batter. Oh, and by the way, traditionally fresh breadcrumbs are used, but I think using dry is a lot easier. And as long as our pudding has enough moisture in it, which ours does, it is not going to be a problem. And I think you actually get a better texture. And that's it. Once our batter is mixed, we will transfer it into a very, very well buttered bowl. All right, the size and shape are up to you. We just need to be able to get it in and out of the pot we're going to steam it in. And what we'll do is transfer that in and press it down. And then we'll smooth out the top at which point we'll place over a circle of parchment paper. And to make that, simply fold it up like you're doing a paper airplane, although it's really more like a paper rocket, and then simply cut it about the same length as the radius. No, not the diameter, the radius. And that's it, we'll just open it up and press it down. And that's gonna protect the top of our pudding. From what? I'm not sure. But that's just how it's done. And then once that's been parchment papered, we're gonna stretch over two pieces of plastic wrap Right, there's one, and there's two. And then we'll place this on top of a third piece that's nice and long, and we will bring those ends up and over to really hold everything nice and securely. And by the way, in case you're wondering, and I'm pretty sure nobody is, but in the business we call that cater wrapped. And then after the plastic, we will place over two pieces of foil. All right, there's one, and there's two. And then just to hedge our bets, we'll go ahead and tie a string around this nice and tight which means we have to wind that end in at least three or four times so that we have enough friction so it doesn't loosen as we finish the knot. Oh, and I should mention, some people make like a handle on this with the string so that they can pull it out of their steaming pot, but I've never liked that idea, and I always thought it was a better idea to just find a big enough pot. And that's it, we'll trim off the excess, and if we wanted, we could start steaming this pudding right now, but since it takes four hours, I prefer to pop it in the fridge overnight and then cook it the next day which gives our dried fruit time to hydrate. And that's why earlier I didn't need to let my fruit soak with that liquor and the orange juice. So I did pop mine in the fridge overnight. And then the next morning I was ready to steam in this Dutch oven. And I like to place some rosemary sprigs at the bottom so that our glass bowl is not touching the bottom. And you can do the same thing with chopsticks, but then you don't get the aromatherapy and your kitchen will not smell as good. Unless of course you have scented chopsticks, which would be super weird. But anyway, we would carefully place our pudding over the top, and then we'll fill this pot about halfway up with water. And if you're wondering why I don't want that bowl touching the bottom of the pot, I'm really not exactly sure. It just bothers me somehow. And I feel like it's better if there's some water circulating underneath. And then what we'll do once that's filled up about halfway is turn our heat on to high, and we will cover that tightly, and we'll wait for that to start to boil. And once it does, and we're getting lots of lovely steam, we'll go ahead and lower our heat to medium, and we will steam this covered for, believe it or not, four hours. And during that time, there's absolutely nothing to do, except check once in a while to see if you have to add more water. All right, that's going to depend on how tight your lid is. So go ahead and take a peek every hour or so, just to be safe. And that's it. After steaming for four hours, our pudding should be cooked. 
Oh, and don't worry, all that stuff you see is just from the rosemary, which, as I mentioned, made my kitchen smell amazing. Take that, scented candles. And then what we'll do is grab a couple towels, and we'll very, very, very carefully lift this out. And then what we're hoping to see, after we snip off the string and take off the foil, is some very tightly stretched, concave plastic wrap. No, not convex, concave which means our seal is tight and no water or steam got into our pudding. And then as far as the dismount goes, we will place a plate over the top and then very carefully turn this over to reveal the stunning beauty that is a properly steamed Christmas pudding. But wait, it gets better, since what we'll do next is paint this all over with some maple syrup, which is what I use. Okay, in England they use golden syrup, since they don't have any trees left. Okay, they cut them all down to make ships and cricket bats, but either will work, so you decide. I mean, you are after all the Meghan Markle of how to make the surface sparkle, but with this flavor profile, I actually think the maple syrup works out better. And then for a final touch, the top is usually garnished with holly, which I don't have, but I do have a bush that grows out front that sort of looks like holly, although I'm not sure exactly what it is, and I'm assuming it's highly poisonous, so after taking the pictures, I'm going to pull it off. And that's it. I'm going to take a knife and cut a slice. Since we really do want to serve this warm. And by the way, if the slice doesn't come out perfect, and the first one never does, this stuff is nice and moist and sticky. So just grab what crumbled off and just place it right back in. And Bob's your uncle. We have a perfect looking slice. And then since I had it sitting right there, I went ahead and applied a little more syrup before finishing this with a nice scoop of vanilla ice cream even though a heavy cream or a creme anglaise would be more traditional. But you know what happens when you freeze creme anglaise? It turns into ice cream. So by using ice cream, you get both. But anyway, let me grab a fork and dig in. And I'll start with those crumbly pieces in the front. And that, my friends, is one ancient and amazing dessert. Okay, what I love about this recipe, which I've adapted from a Jamie Oliver recipe, is that it doesn't contain any sugar, and all the sweetness is coming from the dried fruit. And to be honest, I really don't like dried fruit, but in this format, steamed with all those other ingredients, including the booze and the citrus and the nuts, it really does become something very special and delicious, especially when it's paired with the ice cream, or as we'll call it after it melts, creme anglaise. Oh, and besides not adding any sugar, you'll probably notice we didn't add any other spices. All right, no cinnamon, no mace, no allspice, no nutmeg which is another trick I borrowed from my good friend who I've never met, Jamie Oliver. I mean, add a pinch or two of whatever you want, but I really don't think it needs it. I think it is absolutely perfect as is. So if anyone has the queen's number, please leave it in a comment below the video and I'll shoot her a text and I'll see if she'll let me come over and make this for her. Whether it's on Christmas or some other holiday, like, I don't know, 4th of July. Hey, no hard feelings. But no matter when this is served, or what the occasion is, it really does go down a treat. Which is why I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. gingerbread cake with lemon glaze that's right i'm going to show you this classic holiday treat and when you taste it you'll be like there's no way something this simple could come out this delicious but it does first thing we're going to want to put our dry ingredients together which is regular white all-purpose flour some salt some baking soda not powder soda some ground ginger of course a little Chinese five spice, optional secret ingredient. And of course I spilled too much in. I only wanted a little bit, so I pulled some off the top. Try not to screw up to begin with, but if you do, you can just remove some, no worries. All right, and last but not least, some ground cinnamon, and that's gonna get stirred with a whisk. So all those dry ingredients are combined evenly. Alrighty, at that point, we're gonna add some white sugar and molasses. So dark, so mysterious, so slow. All right, come on, hurry up and drip. All right, after the molasses, we're gonna put some vegetable oil and an egg, one beaten egg, and we're gonna take our whisk and we're gonna stir that together. And like most of my dessert recipes, it doesn't look good when you're mixing it, 
But don't worry, that's completely normal. Everything's going to be fine. You'll see. All right, at this point, we're going to add some boiling water. So during this time, while we were mixing the other ingredients, I had a tea kettle on the stove simmering away. We're going to dump in half a cup of boiling water right on top of the batter. It's going to totally steam up your lens, unless, you know, you're not filming this. And you're going to simply stir in that boiling water until it is a smooth, shiny batter. And some of you right now are thinking, didn't that cook your egg? You had little pieces of scrambled egg in there, didn't you? No, I didn't. All right, it's not going to do anything. Just pour it in, stir it together. And when it looks like that, you're ready to fill your baking dish. All right, so I have a 9-inch square baking dish. It might be 8-inch, but it's probably 9-inch. I didn't measure. I've greased it, and I've lightly floured it. So use a spatula, scrape every last bit of batter into that dish, and then, oh, you know what's coming next, the old tapa tapa. All right, and we're not just doing it for fun here. We want to tap that, and we want to tap that good, because you'll see all these little bubbles will come to the top and pop, and that's why we do the old tapa tapa. All right, we're going to bake that in the middle of a preheated 350 degree oven for 35 minutes. And while that's happening, we are going to make our ultra simple lemon glaze. So we're going to take powdered sugar, some lemon zest, just the beautiful yellow part of the lemon. Do not grate down to the white part. Then we're going to add lemon juice. And one of my favorite sites in the kitchen is powdered sugar melting or dissolving if you're like a scientist, into some liquid. I could watch that all day. Now I put this on very low flame and I just stir it until the sugar dissolves and it's warm to the touch. Not hot, just warm. In fact, you could probably skip this step and just mix it and not even put it over heat, but I've always done it over a small flame just to warm it through. So that's what I do. It only takes a minute. When the sugar's dissolved and it's warm to the touch, turn it off and reserve until needed. All right, our glaze is done. It's been 35 minutes. I pull out my gingerbread. And how do I know it's done? Because a bamboo skewer comes out clean. By the way, is that a gorgeous brown color or what? I wish I had some pants that color. People would be like, hey, cool brown pants. And I'd be like, uh, they're not brown, they're gingerbread. All right, last step here. While the cake is still hot, you're going to pour over your lemon glaze right from the pan. Just drizzle it over the top as evenly as you can. Then take your spatula and just help it along. If there's any dry spots, just push some of the glaze over. Of course, we want to spread this as evenly as possible, but don't worry too much. As this sits, it will all absorb into that warm cake, and it will be perfect, trust me. Once this has cooled completely, that means all the way, and it's not hot anymore, you can slice it and serve it up. All right, you could do a little whipped cream if you want. You could do a little scoop of ice cream. Really up to you. There's no bad way to eat this cake. And it's funny, a lot of your classic holiday desserts are actually super easy like this one. So even if you're not a big baker or dessert maker, you can certainly pull this one off. Anyway, there you go. Gingerbread cake. I'm going to take a bite. So, so delicious. Not too sweet. Just spicy enough. Just such a beautiful aroma. So anyway, I hope you give this classic holiday treat a try, whether it's for Christmas or just any time you want a delicious dessert. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more information, as usual. And as always, enjoy. Enjoy.